Hi AJ. G'day Dave. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I wanted to talk about a very um, controversial and interesting topic for me today mm -hmm. on abortion. Mm -hmm. um, it's of interest to me because I've had two abortions myself. Yeah. Something that I'm not proud of but something that I have to deal with and yeah. I feel there's many a women in my situation who yes. have to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. And I also feel there's many of um, other people involved in the decision process that um, need to um, face the responsibility that they were involved in those decisions as well. Sure, like many men, for instance, were involved in the decision of their wives or partners or, or yes. occasional partner being yeah. ha giving an abortion, having an abortion, and therefore many of those men bear a de fair degree of responsibility as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so. so yeah, I've got lots of questions today. Sure. Okay, we might not get through it all, so there could possibly be part two yeah, no if worries. we need to. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I mentioned as as just starting that it's very controversial and it has been throughout our society's history um, forever, I dare say, mm -hmm. um, because of the moral <laughs> issues that we've not faced about it, some of the ethical issues, political issues, and the practical issues of it that. Mm -hmm that surround the, the topic abortion mm, and the medical, act of abortion. Medical issues and all yeah. sorts of issues, yeah, yeah. I agree. So, um, so moral issues, AJ, maybe that's probably a good one to start on, I think. <laughs> and, and then well, I'm going to go into lots of other topics as well, which hopefully will flow. Yeah, well, I feel probably all of the issues need to be resolved, but obviously the moral issues um, there are there is a lot of controversy around the moral issues themselves. So, uh, so the main reason why there's controversy is because everybody basically, when it comes to a moral opinion, has a different opinion. And what I would like to probably say first up is that what I would like to present is not my own opinion of a, of, of the issue, but rather what I've observed through two thousand years of my life of the issue in the spirit world, because I've had the advantage over most people in the sense that. I've watched the entry of these uh, aborted children come to the spirit world. So therefore I had the ability to see, see it from all angles, what's going on for the mother, what's going on for the father, what's going on for society, and also what's going on for the child. And I feel that's probably the most important issue as to what really is going on for the child. But um, I want to say probably first up with this issue and any other moral issue that I ever discuss with people, it's important to understand the difference between the presentation of truth about the issue and the issue of judgment or moral judgment that people have. So I do not have any moral judgment, for example, for a murderer. I don't have any moral judgment of a rapist. I don't have any ju moral judgment of many other, uh, what we would call on earth, uh, like violent type of crimes. I don't have any moral judgment for the person who actually does those crimes. I do, though, want to state the truth about the effects of these crimes and the effects on love and the effects on the people that these crimes are perpetrated against, mm -hmm. and also the effect of we just wait for that go. The effects of um, on, so on the on the perpetrator of these particular of these particular things that happen. And so, for some people currently on the earth. Uh, abortion is is viewed as a crime, and therefore they have a lot of moral judgment to anybody who does or or, or, or actually uh, commits that crime. I don't have that same moral judgment, so so I want to help any person to become more loving, and that includes helping a murderer or a rapist or a, a person who other people judge as an abortionist or or whatever. And I and I feel it's very important to state up front. Secondly. It's very important to state up front, I feel, with this particular subject, that there is actually no need for anybody to have any judgment on, upon any crime. The main reason why we have judgment is because we have a lot of hurt about the issues inside of us. Uh, on, on either side of the judgment fence, we have a lot of hurt. And the more hurt you release internally about any of these issues, the less judgment you actually feel. That doesn't mean, though, that the the issue, whatever the issue is, for example the issue of murder, that doesn't mean that the issue of murder um, does not have a moral answer. 
but so I'm not saying that that I am amoral when it comes to uh, mm. any of these issues because I'm very definitely I've got some very definite things that I've observed from the spirit world and therefore have some very very firm moral stances about these particular issues. However, um, I don't feel the persons who commit these particular things, you know, these things against the morality need to be judged in any way they just need to have some assistance if they want it even they don't i don't i don't need to force it upon them so any person who's listening to this interview need to bear in mind that i i'm not trying to force any moral stance upon them i am just going to be presenting god's stance to you and it's up to you to make your own choices and decisions like it always is well right? yeah well going through all of the questions that actually puts me a little bit more at ease and makes me feel a little bit more comfortable about yeah. asking these questions sure. because then I know you're not judging me and yeah. I actually feel that as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, and you know that I love you and care about you. We've known each other long enough now yeah. to know that and I haven't treated you any different where, after you told me you had an abortion than, than before. No, yeah. you never have. And that I'm grateful for. Yeah. <laughs> so look, let's talk about the definition of abortion first of all. Wikipedia defined defined abortion as a termination of a pregnancy by the removal or expulsion from the uterus of a fetus or embryo prior to viability. Mm -hmm. Now we'll come back to so that. So then there's a the definition of viability. Yes, yep. we'll come back to that. Yep. And then the Webster Dictionary defines it as the act of giving premature birth, particularly the expulsion of the human fetus prematurely or before it is capable of sustaining life. Right. Okay, so there so is there such a time when the fetus or embryo can be classified prior to viability or before it is capable of sustaining life? All right, so that's a, that's a fairly important question. Um, the answer, bluntly, is no. From God's perspective and what you observe in the spirit world, when a couple get together and they have sex, at the moment of, the, of conception, is the moment that the soul of the child has actually uh, been attached to the spirit body and physical body that the that the conceived uh, embryo, if you like, mm. it's not even an embryo at that point. It's just mm. a cell's dividing, mm. and and this happens within a few moments of of conception. And when I say a few moments, not a very long period at all. And in fact, in many cases, if the if the woman in particular is sensitive to that uh, that attachment of the soul to to the growing, uh, shall we call it, organism within the womb at that point, then uh, she will also feel that the that conception has taken place because she will be able to feel and sense the soul of the of the child already. Yep. I must admit, um, <laughs> this wasn't a part of my questions, but yeah. I must admit um, the two pregnancies that I aborted, I didn't feel that. But at the age later on in life, around 40, I fell pregnant again and I knew and you felt instantly it. that I was pregnant. Exactly. And when I told my husband at the time, how would you know that? Exactly. But I instantly knew. The reason why at the earlier stages uh, you didn't feel it is because the, hu the human mind has a, a large... Uh, Denial has a large effect on what you feel. And the human mind in denial has a very large effect on what it feels from its own, from, from its own body even. So there, there are many people who feel very little pain in their own body and yet as soon as they connect, they, they stop using denial as a, as a tool to control what happens to their body, then they start feeling the pains in the different body. And it's a similar principle when it comes to pregnancy, although pregnancy isn't a pain in the body. But, but if, a, if the mind is in denial and does not want to be pregnant, mm. then that has a very, very large mm. effect on whether the person is sensitive to the pregnancy actually occurring. And that was the case in my first two pregnancies, but yes. in the third pregnancy I was desiring it. That's correct. Yes. So since you were desiring it, you were now open to the knowing of it, mm. and the instant you became pregnant, you knew straight away. Mm. And, and the reason why is because the, the little tiny soul if we could call it, it's a, it's, a, it's a soul in their first incarnation. It's not a reincarnated soul, but a first incarnation soul that's, that's now attached to those organisms which become bodies growing in you. There's two bodies growing inside of uh, the womb. One is a physical body and the other is a, a, a spirit body. They look almost identical to each other as they grow. Genetic, their genetic structure is very similar. And, and as they grow, uh, eventually the woman generally becomes aware because of the changes to her body, but, but she is capable of being aware right from the moment mm. of conception. Mm. Mm. Thank you. 
I'd like to just mention a few um, religious viewpoints on mm -hmm. abortion at this sure. stage. Um, our early tr um, Christian um, traditions, Judo-Christians, um, dating back thousands of years, has always valued the unborn human life. Mm -hmm. The teaching of the Twelve Apostles states, you shall not kill the child in the womb or mur murder a newborn infant. Mm. And even like in Judaism before Christianity, um, there were penalties associated with the the hitting of a woman uh, who was pregnant who then and then causing the abortion the, the miscarriage, if you like, of the child, um, that was uh, that was actually condemned, and in fact, the person could actually uh, be stoned to death for such an act under Judaism law. Judaism law. So, mm -hmm. so it began many, many, many thousands of years ago. This condemnation, if you like, of the abnormal termination of a child's life. Mm. Mm. The Catholic Church um, opposes abortion because it believes that life is sacred and mm -hmm. inviolable. Mm -hmm. Um, Orthodox churches um, generally for forbid abortion as mm -hmm. going against the commandments, they shall not kill. Mm -hmm. um, the Church of England states that the unborn child is alive and created by God. Mm -hmm. Islam teaches that life begins at conception mm -hmm. and is created by God. Mm -hmm. Abortion on any grounds is forbidden in the Islamic, Islamic holy book, mm -hmm. chapter 6, verse 151, mm -hmm. states, do not kill or take a human life which God has declared to be sacred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Judaism, the Jewish law forbids the taking of innocent life and stresses that human beings are made in the image of God. Even a fetus in its mother's womb is made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. um, Hinduism. Um, scriptures um, refer to abortion as womb killing mm. Mm. and describe abortionist as the greatest of sinners. Mm. Gandhi himself said, it is clear to me as daylight that abortion could, should be a crime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Would be, sorry, a crime. Mm. So it, it appears that our yeah, major all religions, these religions feel very similarly. They all the had matter. it right. Mm. Yeah. Well, they all feel very similarly on the matter. I feel um, why morally they do have it correct to a degree, their judgment of the person who, be, who, who commits mm. an abortion is where they morally exceed their boundaries. So, mm. so in other words, it's okay to state the truth as, as, a, as it's apparent in terms of, uh, and then the truth as from God's perspective about an issue. It's quite a different then, thing then to have a judgment upon the people who who, who di disobey that truth, yeah. and that's where I feel most religions take this mm. way too far. So, so for example, if we look at Judaism in, the, in my time in the first century, and a, a, a purposeful abortion was taken as a crime, but they then stoned to get death the mother. So mm -hmm. rather than looking at the reasons why the mother did, did the thing, helping her to uh, correct her behaviour in some way or helping her see what the emotional perspective was, and a lot of times it was driven by her being raped or some other thing, that was, and yet the father or the man who, who raped her was not addressed in any way in a, mm -hmm. under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. So often there was a large degree of unfairness mm -hmm. in the way in which a woman was treated with regard to ha having committed an abortion. The same applies in, to many of the religions. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's one thing, and this is why I wanted to say at the beginning, it's one thing to state this is the truth from God's perspective. It's quite another thing then to take action against the person who commits the crime, uh, which actually in itself is another crime. Mm -hmm. The actual taking action of a person who committed the first crime is, from God's perspective, another crime that's been committed by the purpose, persons who take that action. So, so, for example, when a group of people project a huge amount of rage at a person who's committed an, had abortion in the past, now they are committing another crime. That group of people, not the person who committed the abortion, mm. the group of people who are angry are committing another crime. And so it and, grows and, and grows. And so it grows and grows. And this is where I feel religions exceed their boundaries. So, so while it's one thing to pre present God's perspective on the matter and all the religious viewpoints generally you have as their basic principle God's viewpoint on the matter, while it's fine to present that viewpoint on the matter, it is, it is quite harmful then to take vindictive or angry or, or resentment-based actions against the people who perpetrate such crimes. 
So, so this is uh, the case with any crime, by the way, any, anything that any person di dictates as a crime. The fact that you're now angry and the fact that you're now attacking them and the fact that you attempted to use violence against them, and there are many people who are very hard line with abortionists and even prepared to use vi violence against them, and uh, this illustrates how way out of harmony with God they are in terms of their judgment. So, so while I agree with some of the perspectives of some of those religions, um, I cannot agree with their underlying that they're using that as the basis yeah. for an underlying attack upon a person uh, who has committed anything that they believe to be a crime. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. We'll go there, there from that because that leads mm -hmm. straight on to the legal status of abortion within countries. Sure. Okay, and worldwide governments um, have frequently banned abortion and otherwise limited it by law. Yep, and it's very different, isn't it, in every country? Every country. Yeah, and depending I, and on I, their religious background yes, and so forth. and I looked up probably about 30 or 40 countries, and, um, yeah, it was it was a, an interesting concept. Yeah. Even in our country here, in every states. state, it's very different. Yeah. Notably, though, abortion rates are similar in countries um, where... Um, where the procedure is legal to countries where it's not illegal. Exactly. So, so the law has really made had no effect no on, effect on abortion rates, really. Yeah. Yep. And abortion is legal 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 in majority of countries for the following reasons: mm -hmm. to save a woman's life, mm -hmm. to preserve physical health, mm -hmm. to preserve mental health. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of rape or incest, mm -hmm. um, fetal impairment, or economic and social terms. Mm -hmm. Now. That covers a lot of situations. Um, it does, and unfortunately, if we look at all of those things that you listed, they are all the effects of other problems. So, so this is uh, something that often happens in humanity, is we, we make a series of laws only to address the effect of problems rather than the cause. So, for example, one of the things you mentioned is, uh, let's, make, let's make abortion okay in the case of rape, for example. Well, that doesn't deal with the fact that the woman's been raped, and it doesn't address why why she's been raped. It doesn't address the male who raped her and what's going on with him and why he's actually committed that crime. So, so, so all it does is is it create another law based on an effect. You know, in other words, she's been raped. Now we've got to deal with the consequences of the rape. So, so the problem that I see with almost all laws in humanity at the moment is is they primarily deal with effects only. They don't actually address the causes. For example, a woman getting sick during pregnancy, for example, there is a cause to that, and there are specific causes to this that that generally the medical profession try, blames on the pregnancy, but actually it has other reasons emotionally for causing it. And instead of discovering those reasons emotionally, because they don't believe that emotions can create physical problems, they, they then go down the track of dealing with the effect. Of, of the woman getting sick and so forth, which is recommending to the woman that she has an abortion to save her own life, for example. Mm. And, and the problem with all of these kind of laws, I feel, is they do not address the actual cause. And if you don't address the cause, then you're just going to have to continually handle the effects over and over again. So, and usually create more and more laws. Of course, because each law mm. become each cause becomes each effect becomes more complex. Mm. Mm. As we as we stop addressing causes, each effect becomes more complex. Then we've got to create even more complex laws to address the effects. And eventually nobody, even the lawyers, know what the law is on a particular matter because it's been modified so many times and so forth. I feel that is not the way to address these issues. Uh, but but it is the way many governments address the issues, of course, mm -hmm. because they feel powerless to address the issue any other way. Mm. Mm. But mm. I'm happy to answer the question associated with it. That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying that that covers now a lot of a lot of situations. It so, does. are you saying that all these countries, governments, and persons of authority have it all wrong, because we base our decisions often on what the law says we can do? Of course, and and yes, I do believe they have it all wrong mm -hmm. in a lot of ways because they're creating laws to deal with effects rather than laws to address causes. Mm -hmm. The way God works is that all of God's laws address causes and not effects. And in fact, God uh, like, notices the effect but wants us to address the cause so that the effect can never occur again. The problem with humanity is we don't understand the relationship between cause mm -hmm. and effect. We do scientifically un understand it, uh, and most of the time, you know, a person knows, you well, know, if they. I've come struggled along, with it. <laughs> well, scientifically, you know that if you if you drive a car into a brick wall, 
you know, the car is going to crumple. That's the effect. What was the cause? Me driving it into the wall. If I don't drive it into the wall, I won't have the effect of my front end of my car crumpling, right? I've always found it in, um, in those type of situations that simplistic and practical, so I can understand it. But when it comes to emotional reasons of why you did things, I've, I've, that's more exactly. complex and harder. It's more complex but, yeah. and perhaps more difficult to address, although, although it might just seem so mostly because most people in the, on the earth are living in their minds and therefore not able to feel their emotions well and therefore not able to see the underlying cause. Mm. My suggestion is that if you're able to feel your emotions, you often very, very rapidly understand the cause of whatever event occurred and what your underlying motive was to, to actually take, or take that action. So, so why, we've got to be careful too when we, ju- when we judge society, when we look at society and analyse it, that we don't analyse it by through the error that we're already in. Mm. And this is mm. another thing that humanity mm. has a habit of doing. In other words, what we do is we, we look at something happening. Uh, for example, it's often, we often see this with animals. We look at animals eating each other and then we go, so God must have created it that way. Now that, that, is, that is basically removing ourselves as having any uh, potential cause or influence on the actual result. So what we do is we basically say, well, God created it that way and that gives me the justification for eating animals and it gives me the justification for a lot of other things without actually realising that actually me and my emotions are affecting these animals eating each other. And once my emotions change, the animals don't eat each other anymore. And, and that cause is never addressed because nobody ever thinks of that as a, as a potential answer. Mm. So what we do instead through our observation is we, we observe something happening and then we think that that is how God made it to be, when it's not how God made it to be, it's how mankind modified it to be <laughs> and through their condition, through their soul-based condition. And this is the same problem here. Mankind of, of, often looks at a situation, sees it without understanding all of the causes, and then changes laws to change the effect, which actually create oftentimes more causes that they then have to address with more laws addressing the effects of those causes rather than actually addressing the cause from the beginning. On, on that subject, and it probably is another topic, but that would, sol- that would relate to um, the female body and the, and the whole contraception thing exactly. and the whole... Why, why like, does the average yeah. girl become uh, sexually able to conceive a child at a time when she is not emotionally able to handle yeah. the conception. Why does that happen? Mm. Well, there's an emotional reason yeah. why that happens. That's in yeah. all of humanity, actually. Mm. And, and when that emotional reason is addressed, then that problem won't occur. Her body and her emotions will develop at the same speed. And when she's emotionally able to handle giving birth to a child, she will also physically be able to, uh, to, to conceive. Um, so mm-hmm. we, we're doing this all the time with many matters, and we need to stop. We need to stop for a moment and see actually that we are very adverse to addressing the actual cause of an issue, because we often believe it to be too complex. And so what we try to do is create a whole set of laws to address the effect of the issue, because we feel that that's easier to understand. But in, fa- in fact, what it does is it creates more complex causes which then have more complex effects. And in the end, we end up in total confusion as to what's right and what's wrong right across the board in all areas of our lives. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Let's talk about some statistics. Sure. Okay. We have an estimated 44 million abortions performed globally each year. Mm. We're slightly over half of those performed unsafely. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Unsafe abortions result in approximately 70,000 deaths. Of the mothers. Yes. Mm-hmm. And 5 million disabilities per year globally. Mm-hmm. Correct. These figures have come from um, the World Health Organization. Yes, and I feel they're a bit under, actually, what's Are they? actually really going on. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So in the spirit world, you mentioned before that you've seen the results of these 44 to 50 million abortions well there is a group of uh, there's a group of children who pass over in the spirit world who have been aborted and there is also a group of children who have passed over in the spirit world who have been miscarried and if you add both of those groups together in terms of because they sometimes their emotions are very similar of those children it ends up into the hundreds of millions per annum 
uh, yes. of, of these things occur, where, where you know, nearly 200 million children every single year who attempt to incarnate onto Earth and have a life-based experience on Earth don't make it through to birth. It's interesting you picked the 200 because I had read 205 million mm. approximately. Yeah, around about that figure. It's a lot, isn't mm. it? Yeah, it is a lot. It's hard to get yeah. my head around now, that. Some of those have been, in, from, the, from the mother's perspective or the father's perspective, have been intentionally terminated. So that, that's what I would classify as an abortion. And then there's others. Uh, so my classification of abortion is anything from the moment of conception that where a person has taken an intentional attitude towards a child where it wishes to terminate its life. And unfortunately, we tell ourselves a lot of things that it's not even a child and all sorts of things. Yep, but but, been but, there. but mm. we'll talk about that as we go through, I'm sure. Mm. Um, the, other, the other 150 million or so plus are ones that the mothers feel are not intentional, but unfortunately do have a large bearing again based on the mother's and father's emotional condition and what kind of demands they're placing upon the soul of the child, which causes the child to exit the, uh, the, the soul and the spirit body no longer can maintain a connection with the spirit body and therefore life can't be maintained by the physical body of the person who's in the womb. And so the, womb, the, the child in the womb dies, as the saying goes. Of course, the child itself isn't died, it's just moved on to the spirit world under those circumstances. But yeah, there's over 150 million of those happening every single year as well. And each of them have different emotional reasons for happening, but we need to address their causes. Mm. 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 So, well, <laughs> it's, it's actually mind-blowing, isn't it? Mm. Um, so what are the main emotional injuries that, you would, um, that would cause a woman to have an abortion then, do you believe, in our society today? And has that emotional injury, I suppose, changed over history? Well, it's interesting, firstly, that you ask the question and say that caused the woman to have an abortion. See, I don't view it that way either. Okay. I view it as causing the couple to have an abortion because both the male and the female who have conceived have a direct responsibility for the life of the child they've conceived. And so it's not just the woman's responsibility for the abortion, it's also the man's responsibility mm. For the abortion as well. So, so what we need to do is look at the emotions in both the woman and the man that might cause them to consider an abortion. And, and if you ask that question, well now there's a huge number mm. of emotions. For instance, many women have actually had abortions not because they wanted to, but because their man told them that they had to, otherwise the man would leave them. So you could say, under those circumstances, the man had the desire to not have the child, the man didn't want to recognise the child that he'd created and what he's done is he's now emotionally trying to force the woman into an abortion by saying, by threatening her and saying, I am not going to have a relationship with you if you have this child, right? Now, the woman obviously under those circumstances has an emotion where she's willing to pander to the man's desires and, and, and sacrifice even her own feelings for the sake of this relationship. So that is an emotional injury that she has, where she's willing to sacrifice the life of another person, a third party, the child itself, for the sake of maintaining this relationship. So that should tell her how strongly and badly she has a neediness for the relationship, and yet she is not considering the character of the man. He's willing to leave her under this circumstance, so therefore his character is already quite unstable in terms of having a stable, loving mm. marriage or a stable, mm. loving partnership. So, so this is where many people skip over many issues. So, so in the scenario I just gave, who has the primary responsibility? Well, the man, firstly, is saying, threatening the woman, I am not going to look after the child, I am not going to have a relationship with you if you have this child. So there's the threat towards the woman. The woman obviously believes the threat, which is her first error emotionally. Secondly, she is willing to sacrifice the life of a child for the sake of pandering to this perceived threat, which is another emotional injury where she's willing to then tell herself that this is not a life, it's not yet a developed child, so I can get rid of it now and I'm safe in this relationship. So you, can you see her feelings of a lack of safety, not having a man in her life, not having the father in her life and a lot of other things would cause her then to take the action. So, 
So the issue of the emotional reasons why a person would, would take the step of having an abortion is very, very complicated. And I've only just given one of many hundreds of different emotional reasons. And the emotional reason is never the same for any individual person. Mm. Ever mm. that I, you know, you see commonalities, but each individual person has specific differences that causes them to think differently and emotionally uh, respond differently. So, like in my case, my first um, abortion was similar to that, where mm. my husband didn't want the child, yeah. and he paid for me to have the abortion. Yes, but I didn't give it another thought. And like, why didn't you? No, well, I obviously was because had society fear. had already had already told you something that you wanted to believe. Mm. So society is already telling you this isn't a child yet, and mm. so there is an acceptance inside of you that this isn't a child yet. Even though, if you tuned into your feelings, you would have been able to feel the soul of that child already connected to you, mm. but you push that away. So, so. So there was an acceptance already through society. There's this acceptance that it's not a child yet till a certain age, and hence the Webster's, uh, mm. or was it the Webster Dictionary or the Wikipedia de 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 definition Webster, of yeah. yeah, it was a Webster definition that it didn't have viable life yet, and mm. so therefore you know we can term it that it's not really a child yet. Not understanding how how the actual process of conception actually works. You see, there is this belief system also on the planet through science and medical profession that, that the child is a physical entity, right? And, and not understanding that the child is actually also... The physical is not the child, actually. The physical is just the body the child uses. And the spirit body is also just the body, a spirit body that the child uses for different dimensional existence. The soul is the real child, and that was connected to the to the these two these two organisms even before they became an embryo. They're connected to these two organisms through the soul's connection, and it's the soul that's absorbing the experience. So, if 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 people started to understand that it's actually the soul now that feels every single piece of physical pain that 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 organism experiences. The soul experiences all of that. So, so this, this physical body and spirit body were created through this process of, of, of conception to enable this soul to have an experience in both the physical world and the spirit world. Unfortunately, man is capable of killing the physical body, right? And when I say unfortunately, um, I don't feel it's an error on God's part. I just feel unfortunately the emotions in different people through choice make them capable of ki killing the physical ch child not understanding that, that that isn't the actual child the spirit body is not the actual child either the actual child is the soul the half of the soul in fact that God created that split at incarnation and that particular soul is absorbing the experiences of these bodies so when somebody puts a vitamizer you know and destroys the physical body, all of the pain from that, from that action is absorbed by the soul. And, and when people start understanding that, then they'll start understanding what's really going on with regard to you know, any of these things with regard to conception, uh, you know, the, the pregnancy and abortion and miscarriage and a lot of other issues as well. Well, we've obviously chosen throughout history not to feel that. Yes, although when you, when you talk to mothers, if you talk to a mother who would love to have a child, you can, she, she knows straight away generally when she's pregnant. It's only the ones that, that wouldn't like to have a child for all sorts of reasons, and mm. some of the reasons you can understand completely. Like, mm. you know, so, so for example, there are many people who, like in the Catholic religion, forced by the Catholic faith to having child after child after child. By the time they get to the fourth, fifth, sixth or seventh child, they're not allowed to take contraception. And so um, they're now starting to feel overwhelmed by the process of being a parent. So, of course, now they're going to start considering their actions as to what kind of action they're going to take which might be in disharmony with the morality so so even though the catholic religion states that we we don't agree with abortion and the catholic religion states we don't agree with conception if you ask the 1.5 billion catholics on the planet 
whether they actually have contraception and how many of them have actually had abortion. Most of the people mm. who would be a part of the church would be absolutely shocked mm. about the results. Mm. And, and so, you know, it, that demonstrates that there is something further, deeper wrong, and this is what I'm saying about the cause. You know, there, is, there are mm. causal reasons that are deeper than just discussing the effect of abortion, because the abortion is the effect of these underlying emotional reasons which are very different for each person. Yeah. yeah, and you were talking about the um, the pain that the soul feels. So, well, one of my questions was, does the aborted, the aborted soul feel any pain during the experience? Yeah. It, so it feels f- physical pain as well as emotional pain? Both. Both. And, and in particular, the emotional pain is the worst pain for it in terms of... There are, there are nurses in the spirit world who take the aborted child. The, the soul is connected to a spirit body now and the nurses in the spirit world take the aborted child and look after the child. The, the nurse, um, one of the biggest problems the nurse faces is, is actually having the child feel loved when it's already been rejected by its own mother and its own father. Mm. And most of the time by both, you know, both mm. the father and the mother have rejected it. And so uh, this child arrives in the spirit world with huge issues of rejection, emotional issues of rejection. And uh, as a result of that, the, these, these spirits who look after the child, the people who look after the child, uh, keep the child very close to them and are constantly emotionally reminding them that they are now loved, even though their mummy and daddy did not love them. Does that make sense? Mm. And, and the emotional... This, uh, but this is a very emotional process and it, and it takes quite some time before that aborted child releases those emotions. Now, when I say quite some time, because the child has very little intellectual capacity to resist the emotions, when the child arrives in the spirit world, it often spends days and sometimes months, depending on the severity of the problem, it it spends days or months crying as a result of the rejection without even knowing why it's crying. So it has a large amount of sadness and grief to work its way through. Once it works its way through that grief, which is a fairly natural process, and the spirits who look after the child look after the child so that it does experience that grief. Once it experiences that grief, it does not then feel a connection to its parents, generally. So it doesn't, it's not emotionally connected to both parents on earth because both parents rejected it and both parents have very little love for it as a result. And so it very rarely visits the parents and it's only when one or both of the parents start thinking about the aborted child and start having some growing feelings of love towards the child that the child might enter a relationship with them again. Mm. And that could be a very long time. Could be a very long time or never. In some cases, uh, there are many women who have passed over into the spirit world who have had abortions on earth who are still what you would classify in the hells of the spirit world who are yet to actually have a feeling of love towards their um, their aborted child. Well, I have to say from my point of view, if I hadn't have heard some of your teachings about God's laws, yep. I wouldn't have been open to... Even wanting knowing to... they existed. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Or yep. wanting to feel it or think about it or anything. Exactly. So many women who have had abortions on earth pass into the spirit world without even a conception that mm. the child exists in the spirit world and they could easily find them if they wished to and actually even learn about them and discover them for the first time. And so there are many women in the spirit world who who first pass over, um, who have committed abortions or had abortions on earth. And there are many men, by the way, in exactly the same position. Remember, I'm not separating the men from the women here because the fathers have just as much of a responsibility. And in fact, many times they have just as much or more responsibility. There have been many women who have had forced abortions Mm -hmm. through the men that Mm -hmm. I've been with. And, uh, and they bear very severe responsibilities, not the women now, but the men who have forced abortion upon their, upon their wives um, bear severe responsibility. And many of those men pass over without any idea of what they've done and wondering why they're sitting in the depths of darkness in the hells of the spirit world for long periods of time when they believed themselves to have been a good man or a good woman. Uh, all their life without conceiving that the abortion is the reason why that, that, that they're in That's that condition. That's why they're sitting there. Yeah. 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 And we'll talk about that a little bit later sure, on if you sure. want to. Thank yeah. you. Um, does a late-term abortion have different impacts um, 
on the soul than an early term abortion? And I'm talking about the child's soul. Yes, it does. It does. Um, the more the child is developed inside of the womb, the more emotional attachment it has towards its environment, including its mother and its mm -hmm. father, and also the more strongly it can feel the sensations of its physical body. So, so if a late-term abortion occurs, the child has a very, very strong uh, sens sensations from its physical body. So if you compare that to somebody taking the morning after pill and aborting the child at that point, um, you know, the physical sensation involved is very, very different. The emotional sensation is uh, also very different because the child's had the uh, chance to attach emotionally to the emotions of its parents while it's in the womb. And so as a result, the longer it stayed in that condition, the more connected it is to the parent's emotions. And so when it is rejected through the process of an abortion, um, it, it does have a very, very strong emotional reaction to the abortion when, in comparison to the, the, mm. the firstly conceived child. Mm. The firstly conceived child might cry for a few days or a week of human time, uh, for example, about its rejection. Uh, but because it's now receiving a lot of love from from other people in the spirit world, uh, it can easily reattach to those people as their parents, if you like. Does it Where have a concept of love at that stage? It has a concept of love because in built within all of us is this underlying feeling that we know when we're feeling love and we know when we're not. And, uh, and so, yes, the child has a concept of love at that stage. It doesn't have an intellectual awareness of, how, of anything other than how it feels. So, so it doesn't mm -hmm. have an... Uh, oh, that's what the feeling of love is. It, can't, it doesn't know that at that stage. It just feels. Um, whereas a child who maybe, let's say a child is uh, aborted at, at five months of, of, of into, into its term, then it's had five months of connection to its mother. It now has a far more developed physical body, almost uh, in a lot of ways, almost completely developed physical body. Most of its limbs are present now and there's lots of other parts to its body that uh, it's now aware of. And, and then when, that, when, the, when the child is aborted, it goes through quite a lot of physical pain and also quite a lot of emotional pain because of the, the loss of the connections that it developed up until that time. And so a child in that condition may cry for up to even a year in the spirit world um, when it first arrives. Um, but most of them, will put, under those circumstances, would cry up to three months of time before they've released all of those emotions and how they feel. And then uh, they have the chance then to connect to the, and bond to the person who's nursing them in the spirit world. That's um, quite disturbing for me because um, um, I was in denial that I was pregnant mm -hmm. um, through fear mm -hmm. um, in both my instances and sort of almost rubbing vanishing cream on my tummy, yeah. you know. So, and so my abortions were both late-term abortions. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's very disturbing yeah. to hear that. And so, yeah, the, the key is to allow yourself to feel, you know, the emotion. The, the beauty of this whole thing, too, is that, you see, the abortion is the effect this is the thing to remember. It's the effect of a number of causal emotional issues inside of a person. So your taking a late-term abortion was the effect of a number of issues. Firstly, it was the effect of you remaining in denial mm. that you were actually pregnant mm. and wanting to deny that you were pregnant. Can you see mm. there's that effect already? So you would need to examine why you wanted to, do, to remain in denial that you were pregnant. What, what, why did you want to ignore that you were pregnant? And there will be all sorts of issues. There will be the father's opinions of the pregnancy, the father's opinions of your relationship, your own opinions of if you have a child, how it will affect the father when he's so anti having the child. And there's all these factors involved in why you wanted to remain in denial. And then um, also there were a heap of belief systems that you can see that would have been a part of this. So belief systems that it's not really a child until it comes out of my womb uh, in a natural birth or, mm. or in some kind of birth process. Uh, like, a, you know, like, uh, um, what am I thinking of? A um, C-section, you know, yeah, caesarean section or something like that. And, and, and so, you know, there's the, there's the thinking that, and this, this sometimes amazes me, the thinking. Often the same doctor who performs an abortion is happy to perform the abortion with the justification of certain actions uh, before the full term of the child. But when the child's become full term, the same doctor will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours Saved. of his own time trying to save that child 
mm-hmm. you know, in a human crib or something like that. Um, and this is one of the conundrums, if you like, of the human of the human con- concept of life. In that, in that we often, because we don't have a very, we have a very ill-defined viewpoint of life, unfortunately, on the planet. And as a result of that, we take sometimes completely the opposite actions that you would expect under certain circumstances. The reality is, from God's perspective, the child at the time of conception is now attached to to the organisms that are growing within the mother's womb, which eventually turn in, turn into the embryo and the fetus, and and um, and at the moment of attachment, that particular soul of a child is now experiencing life through that connection. It's now experiencing emotions through that connection. It's now experiencing physical sensations through that connection, even though it is not intellectually conscious until the brains of both bodies develop. It is still emotionally conscious because the soul is emotionally conscious at the time of conception. You mentioned doctors there and nurses. Mm -hmm. Um, For people carrying out um, or assisting or encouraging or defending abortion, Mm -hmm. um, what's the impact on their souls? Yes, a very large effect. Every every single one of these people generally, if they don't uh, change their actions and sort of feel sorry for their actions when they're alive on earth at some point, every one of these people pass into the hells of the spirit world and then go through a process of coming to realise what they've done. Once they realise what they've done, they are able to progress in the spirit world and get out of the condition they're in. But many abortionists do not are not aware that they assisted murder after murder after murder after murder from from the perspective of God's laws, and therefore they arrive in the spirit world uh, with a lot of justification of their actions, but also in a very very dark condition, and uh, and many of them remain in that condition for many hundreds, and I've seen many remain in that condition for thousands of years actually. I um, saw a program on television once, and it was an American program, and it was about um, it was an anti-abortion program, mm-hmm. and um, it was about a doctor in America who ran an abortion clinic, mm-hmm. um, and this man um, uh, had had performed um, thousands and thousands of abortions, and mm-hmm. the interview with him, he was in total denial. Mm-hmm. Um, his health was um, appalling. Mm-hmm. He was in in bad, bad shape, and my heart just went out to him, though, mm-hmm. because of the denial that he had about mm-hmm. what he was doing. He mm-hmm. justified, as you said, when they go to the spirit world, continual. He was justifying it mm-hmm. down to every level. Yes. And but physically, looking at him, he was a very, very sick, unhealthy man. Yes. Um, and yeah. so I did. Uh, my heart did go out to him. Yes. It's sad a lot of the times because many of these people who commit these abortions without, who actually take the action, the doctors and, and so forth who take these actions, do not realise that they actually have quite a large numbers of spirits often connected to them, also justifying them taking those actions. So it, it takes often them passing and then there's a disconnection from the people who are with them from the spirit world who are influencing their decisions. And then it often takes many hundreds of years afterwards before they realise that, wow, I've actually committed all of these murders and, um, and justified those actions. Once they do, generally they, there's two ways they can progress. One way is they have to pay for the pain of every one of those children who has who, been aborted by them, uh, or they can go through a process of repentance, which is a process of uh, grieving uh, through all of the reasons why you chose to take such actions. And, uh, but, but it is possible for these people in the spirit world to actually get out of their condition as well. So this is why I don't have judgment for them. I'm just saying what they're doing is in disharmony with the laws of love, with the principles of love. Um, but, and there, there is a consequence to any action we take that's in disharmony with the principles of love. But, but any person can also go through a process of clearing away from themselves the reasons why they do such things as well. So every person can change. Even if they pass into the spirit world, they can still change. And this is something where I have a big disagreement with the religious movement because many of the religions say once you've set your life in a certain pattern here on earth and you die in that condition, then then your life in the spirit world is fixed 
And this causes many, a lot more pain in the spirit world because there's many people who have come to terms with the fact that they've done wrong things when they're on earth, but once they hit the spirit world, they feel that their life is fixed and there's nothing they can do about it now. That concept um, has caused me enough pain after meeting you, <laughs> yeah. let alone when I get to the spirit world. Yeah. Because it's, it's just an, an easy way out. I've, yeah. Now I've recognised it. Yeah, yeah so the, the key is to understand that we can change at any time in our lives. Mm. We can come to terms with what we've done here on earth or we can come to terms with what we've done in the spirit world we have a choice to do either my recommendation to all persons is they do it while they're here because they'll have much more fun in the spirit world after they pass if they do that but but uh, but they need to understand too to a degree god's laws on all on many matters and also god's laws about life and of course the issue of abortion is very much about god's laws about life we're talking about um, on that subject. So, you know, some say that aborted children would, and I, and, you know, us mothers, I suppose, mm -hmm. who have aborted children, would say that, well, you know, they're much better off in the spirit world than what they were here with me because I didn't want them, I wasn't able to love them, and so forth. Well, I agree that a child is much better off with a person who loves them than with a person who doesn't want them and who is willing to reject them. Mm -hmm. I agree with that statement. However, the mother is skipping over a lot of issues when she makes that statement. She's skipping over the fact that she has committed a murder from the perspective of the laws of God. And she's skipping over the fact also that she has caused quite a lot of initial pain for that child. That child has got to feel a lot of grief and go through a lot of things that it wouldn't have normally had to have gone mm -hmm. through if it had a different life. And so she, the mother is telling herself a story so that she can avoid some of her feelings of yeah. sorrow. And my suggestion to mothers who are doing that is to stop doing that and start allowing yourself to feel the child who you, who you aborted and allow yourself to feel the real reasons why you aborted them rather than addressing, you know, just looking at the effects. And, and sure, it is better that the child is with a person who they love but even better again would be for them to be with a child, with a person who loves them on earth. Now the reason for this is that many of these children who pass over into the spirit world without first being born on earth have a, have a, a struggle to understand life to a large degree. Here on earth it is a, what you would classify as the nursery of our human existence. And like any nursery, you learn basic things in a mm. nursery. And, and God intended for all of humanity to go through the nursery. Because if you go through the nursery, there's a lot higher likelihood of you learning these basic things about life and basic principles about love. When a, when, a, when a child is aborted before it has that opportunity to learn about life and to learn about love in some way, then it, it has a bit of a struggle initially to coming to terms with both those things, both with how to exercise its life and also how, how, what love is and, and how love is to be expressed. And there are people in the spirit world who assist the child to go through such transitions, but, but unfortunately it's a lot harder for them than it would have been if the child was on earth going through the same transition. I agree with that concept, but in the way the earth is today, mm -hmm. it's um, hard to come with the terms that the nursery in the spirit world wouldn't be better for them than the nursery on earth well, in, to, in, the, in the way we are today. Well, there's things they can learn on the nursery on earth that, that it's very, very difficult to teach in the spirit world's nurseries. And there are lots of reasons for that, which I probably can't go into yeah. here because of the, le you know, the length of our discussion. But there are lots of reasons why the nurseries are very different in their format and also very different in the way in which the child learns. And what... what on earth there is this sort of natural progression into learning that occurs so whereas in the spirit world unfortunately children that have been aborted have to be taught how to learn and that, that takes a much longer time for the child to come to terms with than it would have done if they were on earth in a condition where they're being loved they have to first in the spirit world these aborted children go through this terrible these terrible emotions of rejection not being wanted, not being loved, and all of these terrible emotions are the very first emotions they experience. And for that reason, much of their life, unless it's looked after very carefully, much of their life can be dictated by those particular emotions for a, for a specific time in the spirit world. If the child was loved at the beginning of its conception and loved through the process, 
then it then it's already the the primary emotion it's experiencing right in the beginning of its life is love mm. not rejection mm. not hatred not fear not any of those other emotions for that reason the child I, any child who is born on earth through the natural process has had some experience of being loved at least right whereas most of the and, and it's rare for a child not to have had some experience of being loved whereas in the spirit world every single child who is aborted has had the very as its very Perfect. first experience mm. of rejection mm not being loved not being wanted not being cared for not being desired and so it, it, it if you think about it imagine your very first experience of life instead of it being this feeling that somebody wants you and this feeling that somebody loves you and this feeling that somebody cares for you instead of it being that it's this terrible feeling that nobody wants me nobody loves me nobody cares for me you don't, and you haven't got the intellectual awareness to to not absorb the feeling. No, so you said, no. So you, there's no blocking it. There's, there's no way of saying, oh, mummy's just in a hard time at the moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. Inside of your mind, because the yeah. mind's not developed at this stage. So it's just getting a barrage of this. And, you know, there's, there's no emotion inside or thought going inside. Oh, you know, daddy's just got a problem with responsibility. Mm. You know, like there's none of those thoughts that can pass through its mind because its mind's not developed. And so all it's doing is receiving this huge barrage of negative emotions for which it has no other experience to compare with. It only has those emotions. Now, if you can think about it like mm. that, then you, then you start to understand how difficult it is when the child arrives in the spirit world. Whereas a, a person who has gone through the, de, the de, having mum and dad who desires their company, who desires their life at least, even if they know they can't even look after them. Let's say it's a 12-year-old child who's just become pregnant and she knows she can't look after But if she at least desires the life of the child mm. to carry it full term and then gives it up for adoption, the child at least has had the experience of my life is honoured at least. At mm. least there's one part and and the mother in this case the 12 year old child has had enough love for this child to carry it full term at least so for nine months it's had enough love for the child to actually love it enough to survive that period of time so so that child has a far bigger head start in life than the child who's been aborted and and passes in the spirit world the child who's been aborted passing in the spirit world has just a whole range of very very difficult emotions of which it's got nothing to compare with to experience before it has the ability to grow and as a result of that it often it, you know its growth is quite stunted in the first part of its life as a result whereas the child even coming onto the earth where there is violence and then onto the earth where there is trauma and problems at least they experience somebody respecting their life and at least they experience somebody wanting them to carry them full term at least at somebody who has enough love for them to, to, for them to experience as one of their first experiences love instead of hatred or resentment or rejection. Yeah. So one of those um, souls in the spirit world, one of, you know, one of the huge emotions they'd have to feel would be self-worth as well. Terrible issues of self-worth. They have until they've released all of these emotions of rejection and unwantedness. They, they have far, you, you know what it's like for the average person on earth with mm. self-worth. Mm. You know, we, most people on earth have terrible issues of self-worth. Well, these spirits who initially pass have, have the worst imaginable condition of self-worth that, that any person on earth could imagine when they first pass. So would they have to be, this nursing of the nurses, would that have to be a part of um, observing a desire for um, um, failure to thrive? It's a term we used to use in nursing for babies. Would that be a, an issue for these what souls? The, Failure to thrive. Yeah, well, because all of the nursing mothers in the spirit world, they, they are there are groups of spirits who are expert at taking all of these children. There are many, many billions of these women spirits who are involved in this job, and and these these spirits ha are very well versed at how to help the child work through these initial emotions work through their feelings of low worth, work through their feelings of rejection, not being wanted, work through feelings of not having a, nobody having a respect for their life and all of these other feelings that these children feel. And these, so these women are very, very capable, and men, there are men and women mm -hmm. who do this, very capable parents 
Um, and what they do is they help the child go through the pain of their initial existence and then uh, because of their attitudes towards the children, the children do eventually end up with self-worth and they do end up with you know not feeling rejected anymore and all those kind of things because the children release those emotions. So, so it's important to understand that the child doesn't remain in that initial condition mm. that it arrives mm. in the spirit world because of the help that it receives. But it's also important to understand that it's not just a, this process, oh, they've passed and everything's happy yeah, for them. Yeah. Not at all. That um, process, um, on an average, um, you mentioned 12 months before? Well, for, for the child who has been aborted, uh, you know, let's say, let's say a mother took the morning after pill and, they, and she was pregnant. For a child aborted using that technique, um, it might have a week or two of crying to do mm. in the spirit world where that, that it will have no conscious thought about even knowing why it's crying. It just feels un unhappy. And it will cry for a week or two. Um, it, it has to still go through all of these other issues, but, but now the, the nursing mother has the ability to give it the feeling that it's worth something, that it give it the feeling that, that it, it's cared for and wanted give it the feeling, you know, all these feelings that, that it never got from its parents on earth. And the mother and father in the spirit world, and, and often it's both uh, who, or either, well, both who do this, um, give it those feelings. And so after a few months of its existence in the spirit world, it starts to feel that it's worth something, and it starts to feel that it's cared for, and it starts to feel that it's wanted. In the case of a child who's been aborted late, late term, so let's say it's aborted four, in the fourth uh, you know, fourth month, or mm -hmm. and some are even bored much later than that. Um, you know, those ty type of children have already got large amounts of issues now when they pass in the spirit world. So their grief may ma last much longer. And uh, when I say much longer, they, you know, I, I have seen children c still crying a year later um, mm -hmm. in the spirit world, or, mm -hmm. uh, earth, a year of earth time later. Mm -hmm. You imagine crying for an entire year without any stopping, really. Yeah. That's what it's like for them. So lots of grief to release. And uh, they take longer also to, to absorb these feelings from the new parents because they're still connected to the old parents. And as a result of that, they're still connected to the rejection that comes from the old parent and the parent on earth I'm referring to when I say the old parent. And they're still feeling the feelings of rejection coming from them. So, so they've got to actually be taught how to completely disconnect emotionally from the parents on earth so they no longer absorb the emotions from that parent and taught how to now start absorbing emotions from parents who care for them and that process might take so it might have a year of grief right full-on grief and then it might take three or four or five years now for for the spirit in the spirit world to 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 help the child completely disconnect from the parents on earth so that it now can absorb some of these more pleasant emotions from the spirits who care for them. Is that soul then growing at the same rate it would have grown on Earth? No. No, not at no. all. No, because it, obviously if the very first experience of a soul is one of rejection, uh, lack of love and so forth, it obviously has a big effect on the soul's ability to grow and also the body that's attached to the soul. So oh. the spirit body of the child is stunted for a period of time as, as well. Uh, because it has to, we have the spirits help the child work through the different emotions, and so it's yeah quite difficult uh, for the child as well from a physical perspective in the spirit world as it is for a spiritual perspective. But again, the nursing parents in the spirit world. I'm having troubles visualising nursing a little embryo. So have I got it all mixed up? Have um, I got it wrong? Well, you're thinking about it from how holding it yes, physically. Yes. Uh, uh, it's more about the emotional connection, the, the emotions that are going on between the person and, and, and the embryo, if you like. And yes, it, it is a little body, some of it very undeveloped, yes. so quite tiny. And you can't, from a, from a spirit person's perspective, they hold it in their, they can hold it many times in one hand uh, in terms of caring for it but they know how to care for all of its physical needs and all of its emotional needs. And uh, just like, I suppose, how doctors must feel when they have a human crib baby who's maybe four or three months prem. I used to be able to hold them in one hand and exactly. make up their bed, you know, and exactly. then put them back down. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes they're smaller than the length yeah. of one hand. Yeah. And, um, 
and it's, it's not dissimilar for, okay. for these spirits in the spirit world when they're caring for these right. very small beings. And would these nurses have multiples of souls? That Often they do. Yeah. They okay. are capable of having yeah. multiple. That Many of the children sleep a lot because yeah. uh, they need to sleep a lot uh, to, to grow and they still continue to sleep in the spirit world for a specific for a fa fairly long time, particularly if they've been aborted or miscarried. And um, and as a result of that, uh, you know, one person can share mm -hmm. the role between many. Um, but, but there is a very, uh, there's a great amount of love that's given to these children. Far more care than than you can, than anybody on earth could imagine at this point. Mm -hmm. you, you have to go there to see it yeah. before you understand. Yeah how much love they receive. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Would you put um, miscarriage, stillborns and premature births um, under the same classification of abortion? No, because uh, if, you look at a, if you look at abortion, abortion is a purposeful decision taken by one or both parents to terminate the life of the child. A miscarriage um, is, is a, what I would classify as taking the life of a child but not understanding the reason why. Okay. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. many parents who miscarriage, ha who miscarry, have no understanding as to what the emotional cause is as to why the miscarriage happened, and in fact, they sort of view it more as like some even view it as God took her from me, mm. Uh, mm. some view it as uh, as a physical problem in she their was, was in it their meant body. to be? Or... Uh, some see it, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why uh, miscarriages occur. Um, each one of the reasons are linked to different emotions and, and very few people who have miscarriages look at the emotions associated with the miscarriage. And a lot of times uh, children who are conceived feel heavily oppressed by the emotions of the parents. So for example, if uh, one emotion that causes a lot of miscarriages is a deep desire in mothers to become a mother, and that might sound a bit strange, but many people, many pe many women on earth, do not believe they are a real woman until they become a mother, and so therefore their becoming a real woman is dependent upon them having a child, and because of that, this emotion is projected at the child, and the child's already seeing the role that it has. It's actually helping the mother become a mother. It, the child is not being loved under those circumstances. It's being selfishly taken from. And there are many other circumstances upon which the child, the unborn child, is being selfishly taken from, and it repels the child from the womb so strongly that the child actually can no longer maintain a physical connection between its soul and the, and the physical body. And as soon as the soul can't maintain a connection between the soul and the physical body, the physical body will terminate. So many parents do not understand mm. the emotions that are, that are causing miscarriages. So I would call that an unwitting abortion in a way. Like it's sort yeah. of like there's emotions inside of the parents that they do not understand and they, you know, they're unconscious of or ignorant about that cause the child to miscarry. The key is to address those emotions. If you address those emotions, you will never have another miscarriage. Right? So, so there are many women who have many miscarriages and uh, if you address the emotion that causes a miscarriage, uh, you will never have another miscarriage. Some women miscarry boys and some women miscarry girls as well. And if you know the gender of the child you've miscarried, um, it, it will tell you a lot about the emotions that, and the effect that it has. So for example, many boys are miscarried because women hate men, for example, and they don't want to bring another man into the world who's just going to be you know, like the men that they perceive around them. And so they often want to miscarry the, the male child. For example, you know, ones like Henry VIII, who is well renowned, uh, is it Henry VIII? All, the, all of the wives. Who had all of the wives, mm. many of whom had miscarriages or mm. give birth to girls. Mm. A lot of that was caused by the emotion inside of him, right. uh, the king himself, and, and, and also the emotions of resentment inside of the women towards him as a result of his emotion. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this caused them to, to attract uh, girl children or, or, or to attract boy children who then miscarried. Mm. Wow. So I suppose what I'm getting to so, is there's very, a lot of different emotions yeah. in regard to miscarriage. In regard to a stillbirth, there's another number of different emotions there as well. And, and a premature birth, there's a number of different emotions there. The key 
The key is to understand the emotions. Once we understand the emotions and clear them away from the soul, then those events won't occur. So the, the interesting fact about all of this is that many of the huge amount of resources that goes into keeping children alive after they've been born mm -hmm. or dealing with the issues of you know those kind of issues can actually be repaired and, and, and sorted out by actually dealing with the emotions in the parents. So if the emotions in the parents are addressed, now we can begin to actually have a lot more safe births a lot more births that are very, very natural without having any complications. Even a complication in a birth is actually a cause by certain emotions. And if you can address those particular issues emotionally, we can get to a stage where every woman on the planet gives birth and gives birth without any complication and without needing any doctor or nurse or any other person around them, just like a, a cow in the field can give birth mm. in the same manner. Mm. Yep. Mm. Thank you. Um, so, but on, uh, still on that though, mm. the soul just still has to experience all the same pains as as for the aborted um, soul as well. No, okay. because the aborted soul has the additional pains. Okay. So the soul of a miscarried child uh, has different types of pains associated with it. And, it, and it, remember, but it still has pains. It, it has, has still pain. has pains. But every situation is individual. Every mm. situation is unique. So, so we're trying to generalise situations that are unique here. But let's, yeah. let's make some generalisations. The soul that is aborted has to go through the sense of being immediately rejected, mm -hmm. of not being wanted, not being loved, having no worth, its life not being respected and so forth. So that's... Yep. Now, the ch child who's miscarried, its life is generally respected. Mm. So therefore, it doesn't have to go through that emotion. Its life is generally desired. So therefore, it doesn't have to go through that emotion. Its life is gen it's generally wanted. So it doesn't have to go through that emotion. Does that make sense? But there are other emotions it might have to go through. For example, if it's a male child and the mother has huge amounts of rage towards the male that she has not released, then he's got to go through the emotion of being hated as a, bo as a boy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Different set of emotions. Yeah. So, so the child who's miscarried goes through a different set of emotions than the child who's aborted. And the same applies to a, to a stillbirth or to a premature birth yeah. and so forth, who dies and so forth. So there's, there's still pain for them to experience but it's based on different emotions. It's based on different emotions, and also it's less directly connected to the to the um, the attitude of the parent of wanting the child to die. Yes. So, yeah. so yeah. usually a miscarriage, the child, the, the parent does not believe they want the child to die, and often they do not want the child to die. In fact, often what they're doing is they're putting roles upon the child before the child's even born, yes, yes. which is part of the problem of a miscarriage. Whereas abortion, the child, the parent wants the child to die. Yeah. So there's a whole different set of emotions involved yeah. Yeah, with, with what the child has to address. And, of course, the parent too, by the way. Yeah, and both parents. And both parents. Yeah. It's always both parents. Yeah. And remember, it's not just both parents' emotions. It's their belief system that also generates a lot of this. So, so for example, if I've been brought up to believe that a, a, a child is not a child until it's in its th third month, then of course I'm going to consider abortion between between when it's first conceived and, and up until the beginning of the third month, if that's mm -hmm. how I've been brought up to perceive things. And so and then if the medical profession says all of that to me as well, then I've now got a medical the justification, <laughs> a so called scientific justification for my mm -hmm. decision, which will also have an effect on my decision. And then the government supports that. And then the that. government supports that. So now the government supports that I've got also an additional justification mm -hmm. for my position. So these are all belief systems mm. that cause me to take it, take the life. Mm. And these belief systems all have to be addressed because they are all out of harmony with the life, the gift of life that God's given. Mm. Yeah. Well, we'll go on to the gift then of life and no the worries. rights of the unborn. The rights of the unborn. <laughs> so it's, it should be the gifts of the unborn then, I suppose. Yeah, so it, it's interesting how a lot of people see a lot of things as rights when I, when, when I actually, the way God views them as gifts and the way I see them is as gifts as well. So, for example, many people think, oh, you know, free will is a right. No, free will is a gift that God gave you mm -hmm. that, that can be used. Many people see sex as a right. Mm. No, sex is a gift mm. that God gave that you yeah, have. Yeah, had a the, husband who, <laughs> yeah, right. who saw it as his Rape right. Rape is often the cause <laughs> of the person who believes give, uh, sex is a right rather mm. than a gift. 
So, so the reality is also love is a gift. It's not a right. Do you understand? Yes. So, and in fact, it's the greatest gift that we can ever give somebody is the gift of our love. But it's not a right that they can demand of us to give. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So me saying then, does the unborn child have rights, gifts, such as the gift to care, the right to care, the right to protection and the right to life? Well, let's look at it from a gift perspective. Yes, please. If I loved the unborn child, I would want to give it protection. I would want to give it security. I would want to give it the feeling of my love. I would want to care for it. I would never wish to have it have some of my emotions or some of my physical actions harm it. So if I really loved my child, I wouldn't necessarily see that as the rights of the child, but I'd see that as something that I desperately wanted to give to the child because, I, because of the feeling that I have of loving the child. Also, if I saw the child not as my child, but I saw it as God's child with, for whom I am now responsible because I chose to actually conceive this child, then I would also have a far different way of looking at things, wouldn't I? Inst mm. So instead of seeing the child as someone I could boss around and someone I could browbeat into submission and someone I could train to become just like me, I would see the child as something completely different to that. I would see my responsibilities also differently. So instead of seeing the child grow up and, and, uh, and become a, a mini-me, <laughs> I would wish the child to, be, to actually fully know itself and fully discover itself. I would also wish the child to fully discover how to love and how to use its free will in a manner that it was in harmony with love rather than out of harmony with love. And I would therefore uh, show the child that there is consequences for the use of its will out of harmony with love. So, so the child can be taught many things through this process and I can also learn many things through the process. And most parents know that they learn probably more initially yeah. in particular yeah. than the child learns in the first few years of the child's life. And, in, and also the parent can learn about what, what unconditional love really is. Like when a child's screaming um, and you, you still have to love the child and care for the child, you start to learn how, how you know, what unconditional love really means to a large extent. And... And so, so I sort of see the relationship between parent and child more as a relationship between custodian and the child because the parent is God and all we have is custody of the child until such a time as the child is self-sufficient. And we have the responsibility to help it understand principles such as the principle of life, the principle of love, the principles of you know the gifts these gifts that we have the gift of free will the gift of life the gift of love and uh, and so as a parent we would then take make a choice to automatically offer the child those gifts because even the unborn child even the unborn child yes mm. and in fact more so the unborn child than the born child i feel because the unborn child is more sensitive emotionally to these gifts than the born child is and the reason why is because it's actually sitting inside of the emotional soup of its own mother, right in the womb. And that is and a soup sometimes. And as close <laughs> as as close as it could possibly get mm. inside of someone is as close as you can get to somebody, and and the child is sitting as close as it can get to the mother in particular, and potentially the father. But during that time, it's essential the child receives these basic gifts from from the mother. But but I wouldn't call them rights. Mm. I would actually call them gifts that we have the potential to give the child. Now, of course, God designed the system so that we would want to give those gifts. But unfortunately, many of us have become a bit distorted in our own natures. And we've walked away a bit from God, but we've also, when I say a bit, that's probably under-exaggerated, we've mm. walked away a lot from God. And we've also walked away a lot from love. And so we've become quite selfish, self-absorbed as, as a human race. And as a result of that, we don't respect these gifts that God has given us. And therefore, we don't respect that God has given those same gifts to, to the little developing you know, child inside of us. So do these gifts become active immediately? Or at what stage do they come in? At the same stage the soul comes in? 
Yes, as soon as the soul comes in, it has the exper- it has the ability to experience these gifts. So, so if the parents love the child from the moment of conception, and want the child, then the child feels tremendously loved and cared for and wanted while it's in that condition. It 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 finds it very difficult to absorb unhappy emotions while it's loved so much and wanted so much. Even if the parent has an unhappy emotion. The child just still feels wanted and loved and cared for itself. It can observe its mother cry without absorbing its mother's sadness because it still feels loved by the mother. But when the mother or the father go into fear or anger or other emotions like that, now it's not absorbing those particular feelings and now it's absorbing a completely different set of feelings. And this is why it's so important for parents to develop enough where they can consistently give the feeling of love to their child. If it doesn't happen consistently, then the child experiences grief. So every time the mother becomes afraid or angry, or the father becomes afraid or angry, now the child is experiencing the emotion of grief, the withdrawal of love. Mm. 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 Wow. (coughs) Um, Can we talk about the afterlife of the aborted child Mm -hmm. a bit more? You have touched a fair bit on it. Um, I've got a whole pile of questions here, but I might not ask them all because you've, you've... given a fair bit of detail already Mm -hmm. but um so we already know um, where the little souls go and who takes them Mm -hmm. one question on that um an aborted child or a miscarried child or a prim baby they can never become earthbound they will always go to the spirit world um it's very rare for an aborted child to become earthbound the reason why is it's already being rejected and of course it's going to go where love is rather than getting the rejection very, very hard for a, for such a child to be, ever become earthbound. And in fact, I've never observed an aborted child who's become earthbound. Um, Would that be because it doesn't understand free will? To... No, it's because it feels no attraction to its mother okay. because of the rejection from its mother and father. It, re- it, 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 it receives no attraction to its mother or father. If the f- mother aborted the child and the father wanted it, then the, then the aborted child would feel a connection to the father, but not to the mother. But that being said, it won't be earthbound because the, mother, the spirit in the spirit world will give it most of its love and most of its care. So very, very rare. I've never, like I said, I've never seen, I'm not saying that it's yeah. not possible, but I've never seen an aborted child be earthbound. There are many uh, miscarried children that are earthbound, uh, because of some uh, connection emotionally to the parent who constantly thinks of them. And it's particularly the case when mothers grieve their miscarriage for long periods of time. When the mother grieves the miscarriage for long periods of time, a lot of mothers don't realise they're actually drawing the child back to them every time they grieve mm-hmm. for them. And it's very difficult sometimes for the nursing parent in the spirit world to actually... The parent, nursing parent in the spirit world can't uh, keep a hold of the child. It would be drawn back to the mother on earth. So what often happens is the nursing parent in the spirit world then tries to assist the mother to work through her grief about the miscarriage in an appropriate way, not in a selfish way. A lot of mothers grieve miscarriages for, very, for incorrect reasons. When I say incorrect reasons, a lot of times the grief is associated with the selfishness inside of them rather than actually grief for the child. In other words, they're grieving their own life rather than grieving grieving for the child. And uh, a lot of times they're grieving their own life because what what a pregnancy or what a birth would mean to them. Does that make sense Mm -hmm. to you? So so for many mothers, uh, the the birth means that they're now a mother. Well, which probably caused the miscarriage in the first place. Often it can cause the miscarriage in the first place. So they now believe they're now a mother. So when, when the miscarriage occurs, they're now grieving that they've missed out on this opportunity to be a mother. And often they have a lot of unworthy feelings that they need to work through of their own related to that, that have no relationship to the child itself, mm. but have every relationship to the, what they believe the child's role would be. And so oftentimes mothers are grieving not about the, about the child itself or the loss of, you know, the potential connection with the child. Because the reality is there is no loss of that potential connection. This child has the ability to come and visit you whenever you want. And also a lot of mothers don't realise that in a sleep state they have the ability to play with their child whenever they want and to be with their child. In fact, many mothers take full responsibility of the care of their child while they're asleep. So that it's only when they come to earth that they can't feel the child around them. 
and uh, so many mothers are feeling the grief of that. So many, many of the mothers don't realise they're actually still got a child, and because of their belief about death being final, final. and certain and so forth, they feel they've lost the child. But in the sleep state, they know they've still got the child, and the child is still, is, the child still interacts with them, and they still nurse the child, and everything happens in the sleep state. And they only remember that once they go to the spirit world and and remember the whole experience many times. So a lot of their grief can be based on that loss of that feeling when they came back from the sleep. Yes, a lot of their grief is associated with that, but a lot of most grief is always most of our grief in the end is to do with emotions inside of ourselves that are quite self-absorbed. So we, mm. but we need to feel it. Mm. We need to go through the process of feeling it. But sometimes we create emotions within us that are not the real emotions we need to feel. So for example, the grief in the mother who's grieving her miscarried child is often grieving for the loss of the child without realising that what she really needs to grieve is why she had so much demands upon this child that the child felt repulsed mm. and therefore couldn't live in the womb anymore. Mm. So she needs to feel those emotions and yet they're not the emotions that, that often they're felt and so the mother gets pregnant again, has another miscarriage and often you have mothers that have a series of miscarriages as a result of mm. their emotions. Sometimes some of this grief fortunately, comes up in the mother ever after each miscarriage and eventually the mother can hold the child full term because she's dealt with enough grief and enough demand to actually no longer have the demands on the child where the child feels repelled. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Mm. Um, That's going to be fairly controversial for yeah. many of our dear sisters on the planet who believe that miscarriages are some, caused by some other thing. And I, and I think I was feeling a lot of emotions about that when you were just explaining that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's quite sad, really. It is quite sad, but the key, the key for us to remember is that if we, can, if we can know the cause of anything, we can solve it. Yeah. And this is something that all people need to remember about every problem. If you know the cause of why somebody murdered, you can solve it. Mm -hmm. you, can actually, you can actually help the person correct emotionally the cause. The same applies to an abortion. If you know the cause of why a mother or a mis chose an abortion, then you can solve it so that there are no more abortions that occur. If you know the cause of a miscarriage, you can also solve it and therefore no more miscarriages would occur and there'd be, there'd be all this mm. less, there'd be less amount of grief on the planet as a result. And this is the beauty of knowing the truth. So, so what I would encourage mothers to do and fathers to remember, because this is also involving the father's emotions, not mm. just the mother's. So, so it is possible for a mother to have a miscarriage because of the father's emotions, right? It's usually that the mother, it's usually, from my experience, the mother who grieves the most, though, unless the male's in denial. Yeah. Yeah, suppresses yes. it more. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so there is often in a woman this, and there's a, the reason why women develop too soon nowadays too is because of this same emotion, this oh. emotion that they've got to be a mother before they can actually be a woman, and it's a very deep belief in most of the, most females on the planet that they've got to be a mother before they are a real woman, and and in fact many many mothers project that at, at women who have never been mother as well. Oh, you've never been a mother, so what would you know? You know, like that kind of emotion. Well, it was it was like world. having when I ha had my son. It's like there's a, suddenly this secret society that appears that you know didn't appear until you actually gave birth. Exactly, <laughs> which is all part of this problem. Actually, yeah. yeah, it's all part of this problem, and 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 this is a lot about the separation of the genders. You know, the the actual disharmony, the unloving emotions that exist between males and females on the planet cause a lot of these particular things too. So the, the cause of these issues are not simple, they're quite complex emotionally. Mm. But mm. Uh, we need to understand that the beauty of knowing the cause, rather than judging the cause, there's a difference between yeah. knowing the cause and judging the cause. If I know the cause without judging the cause, I now have an ability to fix the cause. And it, so the case with miscarriage, if I know the cause without judging the cause, even, even judging myself, if I'm the mother who's miscarried, if I stop judging myself and I know the cause, I now have the ability to emotionally work my way through that cause to such an extent that mm -hmm. you know, I can address the issue emotionally. So I've known women on the planet who have had a miscarriage, which I would actually term as an abortion. They had no desire to carry the child. They, had, they, didn't, they just wouldn't go and do the physical act of an abortion. And so what they did is they actually had a feeling in their body that they wanted their body to expel the child 
and it did. Um, I also know many women who have had miscarriages who have felt overwhelming grief at having a miscarriage um, that they still can't really understand. Does that make sense? Like they still don't really get why it's so overwhelming because they've never met the child yet. Is it the feeling they had? Mm. Mm. If we could turn off that. It's my phone. It's your I'm phone, is sorry. it? <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. And does that make sense, so Barb? Like, yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, the, the, I was feeling um, in that um, interaction there the 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 emotion of um, the mother's grief of um, the selfishness of that. Yeah. Um, because um, the child has moved on in both ca cases and is well looked after, but the mother's grief, and I was feeling because my terminations were all about selfish reasons, mm -hmm. and this this uh, um, miscarriage was also selfish reasons. Yeah, so, so I was feeling the grief about that. Yeah, a lot of times miscarriage is very selfish reasons, mm. and remember, it's either it can be selfish reasons of either parent. Yeah. Not just one of the parents. So it can be the selfish reasons in the male. The male might want to have a male son, you know, at long yeah. last. And, and, the, and the, mo woman, the mother might feel that, oh, he's going to reject her if I have a girl. And, and he's going like, yeah, I hate, you know, why would I want a woman? And, you know, you, and, and in my, another woman in my life. And, you know, he's got all these angry based emotions towards the mother. And also, therefore, the child, if, if she's a girl child, she's automatically feeling this. And so she then goes into this state where she's now terribly afraid of mm. what's going to happen to her in her life with mm. this fa with this father, mm. right? And so you know, mm. for that reason, you know, finishes up not being able to maintain because of the terrible fear she experiences. The unborn child, she can't maintain a connection between herself and her own body anymore, and it just severs. And once it severs, then. But it's mostly the parent's emotion that severs yeah. the connection. So, yeah. so. I was, um, as you know, I was born, mm -hmm. but I was the fifth daughter and I felt upon my birth um, a lot of... Um, my mother knew I was a girl. Yeah. She knew instantly that I was a girl. So she was able to feel her pregnancy. She was. Able and, to feel the little yeah. soul connected, which is lovely. Yes, and yeah. she knew it was a girl and she was in total fear right. of it being the girl. Yeah. And I... Remember being born now, I feel it, yeah. of having that fear, fear of being a female. Yeah, fear, yeah, yeah, fear of my being father wanted a son. Another, yeah, a son. Yeah. And, and this was really your mother's fear yeah. about that she's not a good wife if she gives birth to another daughter. Yes. And many women have had that yes. emotion through history, as you can yeah. imagine, where men have projected huge, terrible emotions towards women about you know, what kind of gender they want their child to be. And, you know, most of the men are terrible, like these men are often primarily responsible from a soul perspective to, for, the, uh, for the miscarriages of their, of their children. So, so we, we need to always consider that it's not just the mother. Too many men go into this, when we talk, discuss abortion, too many men, you know, almost go, or even discuss miscarriage, too many men go, oh, it's not my problem, you know, my wife miscarried. No, you need to look at yourself, fellas. Yeah. Yeah. You need to look at yourself and examine yourself because it's not just your wife's emotions that are the reason for this particular event occurring. But us women don't look at the males um, part of it many a times either. Of course, because many... We can be conditioned, I suppose. Well, because many women have this viewpoint, I'm the mother. I've got a bit more important role as well, oh. which is part of the problem, can you see? Yeah. So, so you know, we have all these uh, emotional injuries about, like many mothers have emotional injuries about being a mother, and some, for some women it's the only thing that really brings joy to their life. And so of course they're going to have a, a great degree of ownership, which is out of harmony with love as well. Too. So there are so many emotions involved with the, the whole uh, whole mm -hmm. process of becoming pregnant and and conceiving a child and also then bringing it to full term and giving birth to it and even bringing up a child. And there's all sorts of emotions that get imposed upon the children uh, that we could as release as parents and therefore have much more uh, sound, emotionally stable and physically uh, um, capable children that we currently do have. Mm. What time frame, on an average, okay, would a an aborted soul take to become at one with God? 
Um, well, it's very, very different. Um, the while while most of the nursing people in the spirit world are at one with God. Yep. So the celestial. Most of them are celestial spirits who mm-hmm. nurse them. Not all of them, but many of them are, or they are on that path. Um, the reality is they don't force ever the child to make the choice to desire God. And so what often happens is the child is educated uh, in, in, you know, through their desires. So as a child builds their desires to know truth, then the, the surrogate parent in the spirit world um, actually educates them with the truth about what the child desires to know. So if the child never desires to know about God, then of course the parent never educates the child about God. Does that make sense? Mm. Everything is based on desire and passion of the child. So what the what they try to do in the spirit world is they do discuss God, of course, uh, as a concept, just like you would discuss God probably on earth as a concept. But But they allow the child's inquisitive nature to determine the course of all discussions. Uh, this is something that's very different on Earth. See, on Earth, it's usually the adult's forced nature that forces mm. the communication on the child. Mm. Whereas in the spirit world, what happens is the child's inquisitive nature generates the discussion. So, and, and what they do is they create the environment around the child to encourage inquisitive nature. So what they do is that instead of creating a very bland... It's a bit like a parent nowadays. You see many parents uh, nowadays you know, have moving things in the nursery of their child and they do that so that the child wants to grab them and, and so it's now developing physical sensation of touch and, you know, having coordination and all these other things that it would not normally do if those moving things weren't present. And so it's very similar in a way in the spirit world but far more developed. So where there's literally hundreds of thousands of different things in the child's environment that are created so the child is, wants to know why or the child wants to ask the question. And so what happens is the spirits design the environment specifically so that the child can ask questions about anything, including questions about God. But they, are, they wait for the child to express that desire rather than forcing it upon the child, enforcing the knowledge upon the child. For that reason, um, many children don't ever find, some of them don't find the divine love path for many years and sometimes even hundreds of years after they've been aborted or miscarried. And the reason for that is that they've they've desired to follow the intellectual path that many people follow on earth and uh, they're now often in the sixth dimension of the spirit world, in the sixth sphere of the spirit world, what you would play in a perfect place of natural love, still being very inquisitive about creation but not asking many Christians about how that creation got there. And so you know, it's mm-hmm. like then, it's like the same as anybody else yeah. then, basically, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. So just like on Earth, there are many people who never ask those questions about how creation got there and all those kind of things, and they want a physical resolution to spiritual problems and issues. Uh, it's the same in the spirit world after the child has, has got through its hurt of being aborted or got through some of the pain of its miscarriage. Yeah. When the child gets through that pain, um, does it have a desire to to connect with his parents, or would it be based on a longing for the p- parents on earth's longing? Yes, it's solely. All, always based solely on the longing or the love that comes from the parents. So let's say a mother who aborted a child when she was young, you know, she was told all these stories, or she just believed what her partner said to her and things like that. And then when she was in her late twenties, she she started you know wanting to have a child. And then she realised that she aborted a child and she felt some grief about that, so she cried about that. And she cried about the fact that, you know, you know, her partner at the time forced her into it and cried about her willingness to terminate uh, just because of the relationship she probably now doesn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and she dealt with a lot of that. And she had a longing to know this child. And if she was aware that the child existed uh, the ch- and had a longing for the child, the child would come straight to her. And in fact, many people who have discussed this issue of abortion with me um, have since met their aborted children mm. and entered into a relationship with them, you know, mm. that they can feel the aborted child around them and enjoy the company of that child and they know that they spend time with them in the spirit world when they're asleep. And so, you know, they've entered a relationship again. In practice, what happens most of the time is because most people are wanting to remain totally unaware of an abortion 
totally in denial of the effects of it, totally in denial of you know anything about the abortion. And most people on earth, and many people in Western society in particular, have no concept that an aborted child is actually living still. As a result of that, they don't imagine that they can have a relationship with them. Yeah. And so for, therefore they only discover them for the first time, many of them in the spirit world, after they've been educated about those matters. The parent, I mean. And so in the spirit world and the parents educated about those matters, the parent still has to have the desire before the child will come. It yes. stays the same. And it has to be a pure desire. Pure, it can't be yeah. one based on you know selfish reasons yep. or anything like that. Yep. So many of the women who have had abortions and who have had miscarriages when they pass in the spirit world do meet up with their children and do work through the emotional reasons why they've done it. Less of the men do it more frequently, and that's why many of the men remain longer in the dark conditions caused by... So, so if I can illustrate, mm. when I, as a male, have forced or tried to force my partner into a abortion and she's taken that action, I bear a large degree of the responsibility of the abortion when I pass in the spirit world, no matter how good my life has been elsewhere, I would still be treated like I've been the murderer of the child, and therefore I have to work through that issue. Now, many men are in so severe denial of that mm -hmm. issue that they, they spend many, many years trying to work out why they're still where they are in the spirit world before they realise that it has something to do with mm -hmm. them forcing their wife or partner or, or you know, one night stand into having a, a, an abortion. And, uh, and so then they generally go through the same process as the women. But many of the women feel a bit more connected to it, of course, because being a woman, you carry the child inside of you. So therefore, there is a, it's much more difficult to be in a large amount of denial about the issue when you pass. But for the, men, you, for the man, you can be in a large amount of denial for a much yeah. longer period. So for a male, they... Um um, they could have repented on lots of things in life, but so totally disconnected from that, and that's what's keeping them in the dark place, that yes. one thing. that one thing, yeah. Mm. And many of them take, you know, tens or hundreds of years to work mm. through the issue slowly, 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 they realise, and then they have their realisations of, oh, I did that, you know, I forced my wife to have an abortion, you know, and, and if I hadn't have done that, she probably wouldn't have had the abortion. And it was only her fear of losing me that caused her to mm. have the abortion. And, you know, then he'd have a lot of grief about the fact that he'd forced his wife to do something that was against her own will, really, just for the sake of him. And he'd to have some kind of recollection of the selfishness of that act. And then he would actually be in a repentant phase and then progress spiritually in the spirit world, you know, progress to another dimension in the spirit world. Um, so he'd go maybe from the from the hells in the first sphere to a higher first sphere condition by having these realizations. Mm. Many men don't realize that that's one of the main reasons why they don't progress is that is that they, they sort of almost view the abortion as the wife's responsibility. Well, I hope many of those men are here today. Mm. Mm. Uh, soul damage. Yes. Um, um, damage caused to parents' souls who have aborted a child vary in degree due to the circumstances at the time? Um, to a degree, Barbara. Um, we need to understand... We, we've, we've talked about the soul damage to the child. Yeah. So if you can imagine the soul damage to the child is quite intense. Um, now, the parent... It, it depends on what type of, uh, how the parent actually works through the issue of repentance. Um, if, if the parent is not sorry for what they have done, then the law of compensation begins working upon the parent's soul immediately, as soon as they've committed the abortion. As a result, the, their soul is automatically in the state of a murderer in, in the spirit world. If they pass that, that point in time, they would pass into very similar in a ver, into a very similar location to what a murderer would pass into, and in fact, many people don't realise that many of the justifications for abortions are very very similar to the justifications that a murderer has about murdering, and and if they started seeing the correlation, they'd realise what's going on. You see, many wow. murderers take the act for the sake of other people. Mm -hmm. Many murderers take the act. Uh, you know, do do a murder for the sake of influence from others, like spirits and other people on earth. Many murderers take the act because uh, I can murder. I'm a white person, so I can murder a black person. 
because he's less than me. So many murderers take that action, a justification based on a belief, which is exactly the same as what mm. an abortion is, a justification based on a belief. Mm. So, so if many people in the spirit world need to, and people on earth need to see that much of the justification for abortion is actually very, very similar to many of the justifications that a murderer internally has for murdering. The only difference is, because of the belief systems, we accept the abortion. Usually society, particularly Western society, accepts the abortion as not being murder when they don't accept the murder as not being murder. They, accept, they, they say that that is murder. Now, from God's, God's perspective, the law is consistent right across the board. So if I choose to take the life of another person, it doesn't matter whether that person's just been conceived or... 80 years old or anywhere in between, if I choose to take the life of the person, then I bear some culpability for, the, for that decision. And uh, there is a soul-based reason within me. And the soul-based reason within me is a lack of respect for life, a lack of respect for the person's own choices and a number of other things. And, and for every person it's different. The reasons or the justifications for it are different. So for, for, some, for example, some people would never ever, ever accept an abortion except if they had been raped by a black man and she was white, then they would consider an abortion. Right? Now, if that is the reason why, then she's obviously got issues of racism mm -hmm. that she needs to work her way through, you see, mm -hmm. and issues of what the stigma of that would be or, and so forth. Others only see it as a condition of rape, so they would never consider an abortion, but if they'd been raped, they would definitely want to abort the child. Um, so then there's issues of what, what, whether the, the, the issues of the child's life. The, the child is not responsible for the rapist's actions. And unfortunately, many times we see the two as being connected, but the child is not responsible for the rapist's actions. So even if we... It would be better off carrying the child to full term and giving the child to a, a couple who want to love that child if we're challenged by loving the child ourselves. And I know of many, of many people who have been raped on earth who have still loved the child. But if we got, don't feel we're capable of that, we're better off giving the child to another couple than we would be to abort the child and have the child go through all these really hard experiences as, re as well as the hard experience of being mm. rejected. Does that mm. make sense? So, so mm. we, if we understood the full situation, we would generally make different decisions and choices. But, but it does damage the condition of both parents and, yeah. it, and it depends on who was primarily responsible. So mm. if the father forced the mother to have the abortion and in fact in historically sometimes the mother was tied down and had a forced abortion, then the father would bear total responsibility for that abortion. Total responsibility. The mother would bear none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then from that range, you've got right the way through the mother deciding to have an abortion without the father's involvement. Or, or knowing. Or knowing, even. And so now, so if you think about all the different emotions involved, we go mm. from one extreme of the emotions is the father knowing and forcing the mother through force and violence to have the abortion right the way through to the mother knowing and not the father knowing at all and she has an abortion in between that you can imagine yeah. there is a large amount of different emotional injuries yeah. in between in between those two extremes of scale and as a result those emotional injuries cause us to take an action which darken our soul further and those emotional injuries are present within our soul but also the action now which is different to just the thought of the action. So we might consider an abortion but then decide against it. That, that's not the same as having the abortion. And, and if you have the abortion, you've now taken an action which has removed, forcibly removed someone from their life experience on earth. And there is, there is quite severe consequences to that in the sense of our own soul, in terms of the darkening of our own soul, the lack of love in our own soul that would cause such a condition. So we need to work through those particular consequences with regard to love. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, thank you. But the key is oh, to no. not view it as a... Um, we, we need to stop viewing it too as a, as a permanent condition. You know, we can work through those consequences. We don't, and we don't have to judge ourselves. We can just go, OK, this is what I did. I can work through the, con the reasons why I did it. I can actually do it, work through it so much that I'll never consider doing it again under any circumstances. Um, if I work through all the issues. And that's full repentance. And that's full repentance, yeah. We'll come to repentance yeah. in a minute then. Yeah. So free will mm -hmm. in all of this. Um, 
does does a parent's free will come into play? You know, there's always that, well, what about the woman's rights? You know, surely she's got a right to decide this or, or surely we've all got rights to do, make these decisions. Yeah, well, let's, so let's, free will. Let's again address the issue of rights. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, free will is not a right, it's a gift. Yeah, and when you look at, do you look at the word rights... It's such, got such hardness to it, and you and look at the word, yeah, and you look at the word gift. It's such it's got such generosity to it, yes. and softness, and, and, softness, and generosity. Yeah. Good word, a good yes. word. Yeah. Now, this coming weekend, I'm giving a talk about free will, um, and so I'll address a lot of the issues about okay. free will and the gift of free will, not the, the right rights. of free will or the <laughs> law of free will. It, 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 it'll be the gift of free will. Right. And if we understand that everyone has a gift of free will then we would understand that our child has been given that gift to the same extent that we have. Mm -hmm. And if there was any sense of equality within the mother, she would recognise that she does not have the right to take away the gift of free will from another person, which is what she's doing. So we're using the term right in the wrong exactly sen- in the wrong part, part of the sentence. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so the reality is if, if I loved the child... I would recognise that it's been given the gift of life by my parent, Mm. my parent. So if I loved my child, I'd be recognised that it's been given the gift of life not by me. Mm. I don't have the right to decide for the child because my parent, God, gave the life. And therefore, the gift of life wasn't mine to either give or take away. Mm. I was not able to give or take away this gift of life. And if I take it away forcibly, then I am, can you see, I am Mm. automatically saying to the person who gave that gift of life that that I have the right to take away your your right to give the gift of whoever Mm. to whoever whoever you want. Mm. And and the reality is there are quite severe consequences in that. That that is, you know, that that's why murdering is is quite a severe consequence on the human soul because we've 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 actually taken away this gift that God has given to a person that we can't even ha- we don't even personally have the ability to give that's the interesting thing mm. we, we have no idea how conception happens no scientists still have no idea how well, of course in the spirit world we have ideas but but on earth the, uh, on earth mankind has no idea really how conception happens and what how, the marvel of it all you know, we describe it and everything, but there's no real idea about the marvel of it all. And and yet, and yet we see it as a. And often we even call it that, the gift of Probably. life. Yeah. And yet we are perfectly able to take away somebody else's gift of life. Mm. And that indicates that there is a quite a large degree of self-justification or selfishness in that act. Uh, by you explaining that that way, I, I can really feel the severity of that. Mm. Like. It's it's huge. Yeah. In comparison to some other things. Very big. Yeah. I, I have no right to take away the gift mm. of life mm. from another person, just as I have no right to take away the gift of free will from another person, mm. and I have no right to take away anything from another person. In fact, anything that they don't want to give, mm. I have no right. Mm. Yeah. Well, I look forward to that talk this weekend. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, soul attachment. Yeah. Fathers from the Christian religion, St. Augustus, mm-hmm. Augustine and St. Augustine, Thomas yeah. Aquinas, Aquinas yeah. um, followed Aristotle's argument mm. and decreed that the fetus acquired the soul after 40 days for males yep. and after 90 days for females. Convenient, eh? Now, <laughs> I'm not sure why males acquire a soul before females. Well, I can tell you exactly why. <laughs> Okay, and I find the concept really funny. Yeah, it's um, not true, of course. But. <laughs> yeah, so would you like to comment on that then? Yeah, well, you know, obviously these men, uh, you know, were both types of men, both Aristotle and also these men in the Dark Ages who were part of the church, so-called church, Holy Fathers, you know, they were all living in a male-dominated society. So they were basically always justifying the position of the male in compared to the mm-hmm. position of the female. They were always justifying uh, different perspectives about both the male and the female. And, uh, and in fact, if they knew medically what happened to the development of the child in the womb, 
they would have had very, very different opinions. But, but because they were driven by this underlying emotion that men are better than, better than women and men have more value than women in God's eyes, they then came up with these justifications of when a, when a girl, you know, when a girl child becomes you know, a fetus or a growing, you know, a person and as to when a boy child becomes a person. And it's just an indication, really, in a lot of ways, of how poorly developed a lot of men have been in the past, even religious men have been in the past, thinking in their arrogance that they would be somehow treated differently by God than a female. The reality is that uh, both genders are treated equally and as of equal importance by God. And, uh, and in fact, uh, once the human race starts to realise that, there'll be tremendously more changes than currently there are on the earth even uh, that would uh, reflect that condition. Mm. Wow. Mm. <laughs> it's, a pretty, it, it's a pretty condescending viewpoint towards women. And, uh, and it's also, a viewpoint that still exists today. I agree, but it's highly inaccurate, but mm. it's also very condescending. And it has no understanding of God actually in it. Yeah. You know, these so-called religious men had no understanding of God with re- when it came to women. And as a result of that, they perpetrated a lot of lies about women. And it's no wonder that many women find religion quite abhorrent nowadays as a result of, of these lies that have been perpetrated about them and their, their lesser connection with God that has always been the innuendo of mm. these religious leaders. The reality is... Women can be just as connected to God as any male and, uh, and often are more connected with God than any male as a result of some of these male-based injuries. Mm-hmm. See, there's 50 days difference there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A lot can happen in 50 days. Yeah, that's right. It gives um, them a justification to terminate a few more women, doesn't it? Well, I didn't, look, I didn't look at it that way, no. Because it's basically yeah. saying that, 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 a, that a male is not, is not a child until... Well, 50, what is 40 it? Forty days, days in. Yeah. So, so it's basically saying in the first forty days you can terminate the, the male. Yeah. But if it's ninety days, you can terminate the female. Yeah. Like that's that's mm. a pretty poor, mm. poor. You know, if you think mm. about the subsequent results mm. of such unloving, unloving theories, mm. it, it just causes like the death of a lot of people, mm. of which they have to bear some responsibility. Mm. Mm. We have talked a fair bit about the soul already, but one question on the soul there. Once the soul's attached and it's aborted, can that soul attach to another body? No. For an experience? So it only has a once of a lifetime chance? Yes. Um, what God, why, the reason why God created the incarnation process is the, at, the, at the time of incarnation, we become self aware. The whole purpose of the incarnation process, there's only one primary purpose of the incarnation process, and that is for the individual person who is unaware in the spirit world to be split into its two halves and then go through a process of growth and awareness. And once the incarnation process has completed, it has a spirit body attached to it. Once a spirit body is attached to it, it can continue the process of self-awareness even if it doesn't exist on earth. So for that reason, any child that is aborted does not need to come back to Earth to continue the process of self-awareness, to continue the process of its own incarnation. Or, or you could say to, to, to continue the process of becoming aware of itself. Mm. Yep. Mm. I, 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 obviously, to, to ease my mind a bit, I thought, well, you know, if, if you aborted a child... Um, and there was a soul attached, this is what I'd tell myself in the early days, that, yeah. well, you know, he could say, no, she's going to abort me, I'm going to hop over here, oh, you yeah. know. It's a great justification for the isn't reincarnation it? process, isn't it? It, it is. And reincarnation, unfortunately, justifies many unloving actions mm. and many people, and this is one I feel sad thing about the reincarnation teachings, is the reincarnation teachings justify the poor treatment of people on earth in a lot of areas, including the poor treatment of aborted of, of you know of the unborn. Mm-hmm. So so unfortunately reincarnation justifies abortion to a degree by mm-hmm. saying that either oh, child now has the ability to connect to another mm-hmm. body. The re- reincarnation justifies things like, you know, being treated as a lower class of persons, such as, you know, the in the in, in India, the untouchable mm-hmm. class of persons who Reincarnation justifies that through this process of saying, oh, they must have done bad things in their previous life, so now you know, we can treat them badly in this life now because mm. they, it, 
you know, their previous existence justifies our treatment of mm. them in this life mm. uh, uh, negatively. And so reincarnation in itself, if, if people analyse the teachings of reincarnation in terms of love, they would soon see that reincarnation can't be actually a true teaching uh, because it justifies many unloving behaviours. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Um, we just talked about that. Let's go into repentance. Eh? Mm-hmm. I know it's a favourite topic of yours yeah. and um, I've listened to you talk about repentance a few times. Um, so I've got a few questions here sure. on it. Yeah. Um, if we need to become repentant for actions, why don't we already at a soul level know that it was wrong? Or are we, or are we just in denial? That's why we're not. We're just so disconnected. That's why we, yeah. Yeah. See, see a lot of times if we were given an upbringing of love, yeah. We would already know what is right and wrong before even being told. Yeah. The beauty of having an upbringing that's completely in harmony with all of the laws of love is that you would all automatically, instantly know whenever an action was taken out of harmony with love. The unfortunate thing is, though, on this planet at the moment, is we're being brought up in an environment that doesn't understand love. So now we automatically have distortions about what is loving and what isn't that we then accept as belief systems and we automatically detune from our emotional Mm. state as well to a large degree. So we're automatically shutting down how we felt about a certain thing. If you ask most women about an abortion and how they actually felt, most women say that they felt some degree of distress during the act of deciding or deciding to have an abortion. right? But it's, it's rare, in fact, for women to actually say, no, I, I had no emotion about it and I was fine. You know, There was always some kind of emotional response generally that they had to it. This is the reason why they go through that initial turmoil before they have the abortion. And, uh, and, and so their conscience is already working, telling them that there's, there's not, they don't feel settled with it. And what happens, though, is that we have come up with a heap of intellectual arguments that cause us to feel settled. So in other words, what it does, what the intellectual argument does is it causes us to dismiss this, mm. to dismiss that, to mm. dismiss this feeling, to dismiss that feeling, to dismiss this feeling, to dismiss that feeling. What about the feeling that I could feel the child? I'll dismiss that child. That's impossible. You know, and, and we dismiss all of these feelings. So what do we end up with? An intellectual argument. And the intellectual argument is always going to be in favour of the justification of an act that's unloving when I want it to be that justification. Mm. And so I will use my intellect to justify my unloving acts because that's the direction I want to go. And unfortunately, because I've done that, I've now taken an action that has a severe consequence both on my own soul and the soul of others. And in this case, one potential other or even more than one if there was a twins or triplets or something like that inside the womb. And that's, uh, that's where... So, so I suppose in answer to your question is, yes, at the soul level, we are completely able to be sensitive and aware to love and sensitive and aware to every time the principles of love are broken. However, because we often have selfish desires and motivations and we're born, brought up in a society that has selfish desires and motivations, what we finish up doing instead of that is we take actions that are justified by intellect with no connection to the emotions of love. Mm. Mm. And that's why we finish up taking the actions we take. Mm. And that totally explains um, my actions, yeah. I feel. Yeah. 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 If, if any person who sincerely looks at this issue of abortion, when they look at what I've just said about those kind of things, mm. they will be able to trace yeah. back all of these justifications, all of these feelings they had, all of these justifications, all of these things that made them feel okay about the feelings they actually had that were distressing to the point where they made the decision. And uh, and we have a lot of internal justifications and external justifications. You know, when I say external, you know, the medical system, our husband or our partner making the justification, society making a justification. In China, there's the justification that we can't have too many people, mm-hmm. and that's another justification. Just, so, so you know, there's justification after justification that are taken that are all intellectually based. None of them connected to emotion. None of them connected to love. And these justifications cause us to finish up taking an action that's quite quite harmful to both the child and mm. to the persons who have made that mm. choice. So then how do we as parents, both 
both parents um, get to the stage of grief and remorse mm -hmm. um, and feel the repentance, get to a stage of repentance fully for something that we've done, usually a long time ago as yes. well. Yeah, so, yeah. sometimes it'd know. be 20, 30, 40 yeah. years ago, oh. often. Well, uh, usually there are steps to repentance. Usually, unfortunately, whenever a person is told the truth about something, the initial response is anger. So there will be many people who listen to this interview who then feel quite angry towards me about this issue of you know abortion or so forth. And even angry about the issue of miscarriage too, because what I've said is quite confronting about that issue. And 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 unfortunately, as their anger is an indication that they are hiding some fears inside of themselves, and also there's some grief that's underneath their fears. So so what most people do when they go through this process is they first feel anger. And it depends how long they want to hold on to this anger as to how long they'll get to the next step. And the next step generally is fear, fear about that it's right, fear of the truth, if you like, that, oh, it's right. Why do we fear the truth? Because if it's true, then we've got a lot of crying to do. We've got a lot mm. of grieving to connect to, mm. we, you know. And so what we eventually do is we connect to the grief, but we connect not to the grief of necessarily just taking the action, but we need to also connect to the grief of why we took the action. And that, that in itself is quite a complex issue, as, as mm. we've already discussed. So... So why a man takes a specific action will be completely different than why a woman might take the action. And, and in every couple, the reasons are completely different to each other. Does that make sense? Mm. So, so if we were truly repentant, we would allow the, you know, with the resolution of these particular issues that we have inside of ourselves. Does that make sense? We would go through the process of looking at the causal emotional reasons why we took the action. Do you want to give an example then? So, 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 so can I use your example? You Is that can. possible? Like, yes, you so can. your first abortion, yep. um, your I husband was... didn't want the child. No. He we wanted... actually weren't married at the time. You weren't married. And so... I was 17, 16 and 17. So, so can you see all of a sudden the justifications popping up? Yeah. I'm young. Yeah. I don't feel I can cope with bringing up this child, particularly alone. Yeah. I wasn't married, yep. so there's the stigma of not being married and having a child. Yep. Then there's also the issue that my husband or my to partner, be. the mm. husband-to-be, did not want the child mm. either because he felt challenged through his emotional responsibilities and, and all those things, monetarily, financially, and all sorts of things. And I'm sure my father comes into there somewhere. Okay, <laughs> definitely will come into there somewhere. And so, so when you start adding it all up, you can see you could even... It's quite easy to write down all the reasons why you did it. Right. Can you see? Yeah. So what I would do if I was a mother or father who's been involved in one is I would write down all the reasons why I was in, what I what my true feelings were what what I really wanted you know what I was afraid of what I was angry about and what you know and why I finished up making the final choice every single reason I write down there is usually some emotion connected to mm -hmm. related to my childhood to my belief systems to my religious upbringing or some other reason. And I need to work my way through them and find the truth to them all. Like what is, what is truthful and loving instead of what, why did I justify it? Mm -hmm. And once I do that, once I recognise the truth about every one of those issues, I will grieve the unloving position and I'll work through the reasons why I did what I did. Does that make sense? Yeah. Once yeah. I work through the reasons I've done what I've done, now I've cleared away from my soul the underlying per the reasons why I did it and I have a feeling of remorse for having done it, I will probably at that point also want to or wish to connect to my child as well. So I won't avoid the connection to my child. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, when I've... When I've um... Can I just pause for a while? Yeah, sorry. Okay, so, so we'll start again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the justification of the um, ab abortion and... Yeah. Every time I get to the stage where I'm feeling um, some grief and emotion about it, yep. um, I get shown pictures yep. that they're happy, they're good, they're, you know, there's no big deal. Yes. So it takes me out of that emotion every time. What's happening is you have uh, surrounding you a group of spirits, women spirits who have also had abortions, who want you to just be happy, right? And they want you to, to avoid the grief of the abortion itself. 
So every time you go into the grief about the abortion and you will start working your way through an issue, all they want to do is show you a pretty picture. Yes. And it is true that your children are now very, very happy and they're very content, so it is a true picture of how they currently are, but the spirits doing it with you are only doing it to help you get out of the emotion, which is not a very unloving action. And they are doing that because they don't want to feel the same emotion that you're currently connecting to. Does that make sense? You mean that's not a very loving action on their part? It's not a loving action on their yeah. part yeah. to want to help you get out of the emotion of yeah. dealing with the effects of the abortion. Yeah. But, but they, believe, they also need to go through the same emotion and they, and they don't, don't want to. Mm. And that, so they feel like extra motivation to, to okay. just give you a pretty picture and help you get out so of So if I emotion. persevered with that and prayed and, and connected and persevered and with that... And speak with those spirits that it are would giving help you the them. picture. Yeah, talk to them about, OK, while you think you're doing the right thing, the reality is, as we've discussed, our, my child felt all this pain, my child felt pain, a significant amount of pain for a long period of time, I'm responsible for that. I need to be sorry for that. You know, you can talk to the to the mm -hmm. spirits with them. And you need to be sorry for the fact that you did the same thing to your children and you need to be have a degree of responsibility for that as well. And the reason why you are where you are, you know, those spirits, is because they are not yet letting themselves feel the grief. In fact, these are earthbound spirits who just cycle the earth telling women, they go around the earth connecting to women who have had abortions who feel bad about it, and they try to make the woman feel good about it. That's all they do. And all they're trying to do really is trying to make themselves feel good about their own abortions that they've committed, mm -hmm. right? If they felt, if they chose to take a different action, they would do a very different thing. A celestial spirit guide will not assist you to avoid an emotion. They will not give you pretty pictures while you're going through an emotion. They might give you one afterwards, mm -hmm. <laughs> but not during. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they might come and reassure you afterwards that no, everything's fine now and the child's fine and you, you can meet them if you want and all those kind of things. But they will not assure, reassure you of it beforehand, before you go through the emotion. These are darker spirits who have yet to even enter the spirit world. They're earthbound, who, who want to avoid their own responsibility for their own actions. And so they want to avoid the response. They want to help you avoid the responsibility for your actions too. I find it very interesting in New Age circles that many women have been given these pictures yeah. as a justification for their abortion and it actually even encourages those same women to have future abortions, which is, which is very sad when you think about it in terms of, in terms of what these spirits are trying mm. to accomplish. So these women's oh, spirits... So they're even... In, they're, they're, these their women, actions can encourage you to continue having abortions? Yes, of course. So Is that the, a deliberate action? On yes, many, for many of them, they believe the abortion was fine to have done. You should have done it under that circumstance. And they're actually encouraging women to have abortions. How many women on earth actually feel bad about having abortion and yet the environment all around them, including their women friends, is encouraging them to have an abortion? Mm -hmm. Where do you think that influence comes from? Mm -hmm. It comes from many of the women's spirits who have had abortions who have yet to deal with the fact that they're murderesses. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. And what, what, unfortunately what I see happening too, if you're in the spirit world, what happened uh, hundreds of years ago, like the primary, uh, primary cause of abortion, a lot of the cause of abortion were related to the men. Nowadays, unfortunately, much, much of the causes of abortion are related to the women. And as a result of that, women passing, there are much more, there are many more women passing into the spirit world in the condition of a murderess, right? Someone who's committed murder, than there were many hundreds of years ago. And, and so what's happening now is the spirit world is, you, you think for the average person on earth, uh, in a modern woman, like you know, maybe under 30, many of them would instantly consider an abortion if their circumstances weren't completely right to have a baby. And so sometimes now there's even up to 20, 30 percent of women of a certain age bracket and lower who are actually having abortions. And every one of them finishes up becoming a murderess. Every one of them enters the spirit world in that condition unless they work through these issues before then. And this is what I feel is very, very sad on the planet is we see a, a growing number of women who would not be murderesses under normal circumstances mm. are now, through society acceptance and through a lot of other factors, are now justifying the murder of children. Mm. And, uh, and this is a very, very damaging thing to, to women's general plight. It would be far better if women went full term and gave away their child. 
however, there is so much stigma about that, you know, that most women can't even consider that, can't even consider taking a child to full term and then giving away the child because how much would society then say, what kind of a mother are you? <laughs> and yet the society doesn't say, what kind of a mother are you having an abortion? Well, I remember so, when I was nursing, yeah. um, there was a, a campaign going on the t around at the time, and I think it might have been on television. Yeah. I can remember the brochures, and it, its its phrase was, um, is adoption the best option, yeah. you know? Um, where it was encouraging, it was encouraging, I felt, women to go full term and then adopt. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know where it came from, whether it was... There are many women on this planet who would love to have a child or, or, or more children and who cannot. Yeah. There are many single women on this planet who would love to have a child um, as well. And so, you know, there are many people on the planet who would willingly take out... But adoption is made so difficult Tears. because of the legal uh, mm -hmm. problems that are associated with with adoption. Um, it's made so difficult, and, and it's made so difficult because of the general attitude of humanity, and that is this general attitude: if a mother gives away her child, she's a terrible person. So that that's an under, underlying cause of why why the attitude is so bad. Yeah. Um, but if we had a totally different attitude, we would, uh, you know, it would be a really loving process to take the child to full term, give it to a person who has a who has a desire to, to look after the child and love the child. I really liked them. There's a movie. It's a sort of fairly humorous movie, but there's a movie associated with that kind of thing that I'd advise people to watch. Actually, it's called Juno. Oh, I guess. Yeah, yes. and, and it's just mm. a lovely example of, mm. a, of a young girl who mm. took, decided to take the child to full term. Mm. All the ostracism she had to put up with by, from, by you know people around her and so forth, but she was quite definite. And the amount of love that she had in her to mm. do that. And, uh, and I just feel it's a remarkable... It's sort of a lovely movie demonstrating, I feel, what is possible. Um, unfortunately, though, the... There are a lot of complexities involved in taking a child full term when everybody around you feels differently. Mm. And, uh, and so therefore there's a lot of peer pressure and external pressure to terminate. And there's a lot of peer pressure and external pressure to terminate under all sorts of circumstances, including possible defamation of the child and other types of circumstances. And, and these, these high amounts of pressure result in, in women taking decisions that they often later regret. Mm. Did we cover repentance enough, do you believe? Um, well, there's a lot more that can be said about repentance, but, but Mary whole... in the book group is going through <laughs> repentance a lot, yes. and, and, yep. and it is a different subject in its own right, because we have a lot of things to repent for, not yep. just for uh, committing abortions. But um, so, so I feel that is a subject that needs to be focused on quite a lot. If, if we can understand, if we do not repent from, from taking you know, actions that we've taken out of harmony with love, then, then the law of compensation, the, the law of what you sow you will reap, will definitely come into action. And, and while many of the people on earth don't experience that while they're on earth or they're not sensitive to the experience of it while they're on earth, they will definitely experience that in the spirit world. So, that, so, so if a person decides to ignore all of what I'm saying about abortion uh, on earth and decides not to deal with the emotions while they're on earth, they will come face to face with uh, these exact same emotions in the spirit world and have a very unhappy time in the spirit world after their entry into it unless they address those emotions. So let our last question be then, how can we best assist our brothers and sisters in the spirit world um, to understand this process of repentance? I sort of feel like we need to best assist everybody, not just the brothers and sisters in the spirit world, yeah. but everybody to understand the process of repentance. Um, and, and one of the best ways to understand repentance is to actually tell the truth. Like, if you know the truth about something, then you know what you have to be sorry for and what you don't have to be sorry for. For, for example, religions on the planet often teach that masturbation is wrong, right? So many people pass over believing that, that sometimes they've arrived in a dark condition because they believe that, that they masturbated a lot during their life and as a result of that, they passed over into a dark condition. Does that make sense? They believe that because they were told that by the ministers or priests that told them those particular things. Now, that, that is an example of an untruth being mm -hmm. perpetrated upon a person then passing and, and not understanding that it's got nothing to do with that as to why they might be in a dark condition. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So an untruth in this case uh, stops them from progressing. Yeah. And, and quite often it's the untruths that are the problems. So, so what I feel is we need to understand the truth of the soul, the human soul. We need to understand the truth about the physical body, the spirit body. We need to understand the truth about all of these creations of God. Once we understand the truth about the gifts we've been given, the gift of love, the gift of free will, the gift of life and so forth, once we understand these truths, we will have a much greater capacity to connect to our own sorrow about any time that we have been in disharmony with these truths. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If we don't understand mm -hmm. the truth, and the truth is never discussed or the truth is, is ridiculed and laughed at, then at the end we can't address the emotion because we're going to deny the emotion. And because we're going to deny the emotion, we will never get past the point, even, and, and, and oftentimes we'll arrive in the spirit world not past the point, and often for many hundred years in the spirit world we will not even realise the point. So I feel the primary way to, accept, to assist any single person, whether they be on earth or in the spirit world, is to tell them the truth, not to judge them because that is very unhelpful mm. and it's also very unloving, but to just tell the truth, just like I have in this interview with you. Tell the truth of how it is and, and let the persons then come to their own conclusions and, and their own process. If you don't tell the truth, then you don't have you're not giving the other person any opportunity to grow. So the more we speak... The more we speak the truth. Yep. So the more I speak the truth to women who have had abortions about yep. abortions... Yep. And, and the more I speak to my women friends... And in the spirit world and yep. on earth yep. about the issue of abortion, the more truth they will know. The more truth they will know, the less inclined they will feel to make decisions that are out of harmony with love and out of harmony with truth. Yeah. That's a natural consequence. Yep. If we don't say any truth, and we don't, it, and also it's very important not to say it in a spirit of judgment, because yeah, yeah. the judgment in itself will mm -hmm. prevent the person from accepting the truth. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to state the truth without the feeling, of, corresponding feeling of judgment, mm -hmm. and then when so I can discuss. So when you came and first discussed abortion with me, you did not feel judged, even though I spoke the truth. Mm -hmm. Because right? I still love you and I still hugged you and I still cared for you exactly the same way before and afterwards. And as a result of that, you know that, that there's a higher likelihood of the person receiving the truth. It's a totally different judged. feeling from my point of view and I'm sure everybody's point of view. It's a totally different feeling than um, somebody discussing it with you that is judging you. you, can, you it just never enters you. Yeah. So truth with judgment, I now realise, can never enter you. It's very hard. Well, you have to be a very humble person for truth yeah. with judgment to enter you, I, I should say. <laughs> it is possible for truth to yeah. enter you, even though it comes with judgment. Yeah. But you have to be a very, very humble individual for that to okay. occur. You have to cope with a lot of quite hard emotions that most people find very difficult to cope with. It is much easier for a person who hasn't that degree of humility to accept truth without judgment and this mm. is why and judgment in itself is an, un an unloving act mm. and an act based on violence it's a way of attacking the person and any attack whether it be emotional or physical is an act of violence so a judgment of another person is an act of violence perpetrated by yourself towards the other person mm. and if we judge any person including a person who has committed an abortion a person who has raped a person who has murdered a person who has child molested a person and we could keep listing all of these different things that might we might feel judgment about if we judge them it's very very hard to help them heal and it's very hard to help them change mm. What, and also there's often quite a lot of anger associated with the judgment inside of us, which is about our own hurt and our own feelings of sadness and grief that we need to experience. Yeah. And, and those emotions prevent even those people from healing because they have to be very humble to absorb our judgment if they are going to still heal. Mm. It's far better mm. if, we, if we can discuss these truths openly without judgment now everybody has the ability to us to go. Okay, if I had an abortion, yes. Okay, you know, just saying, I've got to not be hard on myself here. I've got to work through the emotions. You know, you know, I don't have to feel condemned by the universe, but I do need to work through these emotions. If I don't, then I've got some issues with life. I've got some issues with free will. I've got quite a number of issues which are going to make my soul dark here, and I can address those particular issues. And if I can do that without judgment, now I've got the ability to recover from them quite. 
quite a lot more easily than if the world around me judges me completely for that action. And this is why anger, the, the right to life movement in the USA, for example, which is very much born in anger, anger. for mm. a lot of people, mm. uh, doesn't have very much effect on people who have abortions because it has so much judgment towards them mm. uh, without any understanding of all of the conditions that create it. Um, that the persons who commit abortions even feel more resistance to even listening to the truth mm. of it. Mm. And that's why I feel those kind of movements are not very beneficial in the end. They are beneficial if they were brought into harmony with love without the anger, without the judgment, then they'd be beneficial. But with the anger and the judgment, they're not very beneficial. They just add to the problem. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. Now, were they all the questions, were they? Because um, there were some questions you had about... Uh, con, um, I think I no, skipped pretty much all of them, yeah. wasn't it? I think we covered every topic. I didn't ask every specific question. Yeah. Is yeah. this something you feel... No, that no, I that's fine. Out? I feel that was quite a good coverage of, the, of, of it. Um, there is a lot more that can be said on any subject, of course. Look, I have, I have a collection of... Um, um, I've put it under the heading of hypothetical moral questions yeah. that have come from the community of large, yeah. and there's probably six pages of that. Wow. Yeah. So if you would like in a, a second section um, to have and, and just answer them. Sort of a discussion of, yes. moral, of sort yeah. of the hypo hypotheticals. Yeah, situations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you want to do that, we could sure. have a second interview. Sure. If you felt that was... All good. hypothetical situations are interesting because they do help us to analyse a, a lot of issues. The, the problem with a lot of hypothetical situations, though, is they don't... We need to include the analysis right across the board, not just... Yes. So, so a lot of these questions will raise... Very specific. ...issues about lots of different matters mm. rather than just the matter of abortion. Yeah. So... Um, and, th and that's very true. And that's, and that's I, important. That's why that's when I started reading them, um, I thought, OK, wow, these are great questions, but they are all encompassing yeah, as yeah. well. So I don't mind uh, handling them as long as uh, in the next section we're willing to sort of digress a little yes, because it, because there to. will be issues of points of like when is a child a child when it, you know it, the, the, how incarnation occurs and all these yes, other things yes. and so my suggestion to people who are who are investigating these matters further would be if they listen to some of the the introductory presentations I've made about you know the secrets of the universe and and how you know incarnation actually occurs the process of incarnation onto earth and and the process of the creation of the bodies and uh, all of those kind of things then i'll have a lot better background uh, mm -hmm. i feel to mm -hmm. understand my answers that i've given to you in this discussion and also the answers that we might discuss with regard to a future discussion on abortion with regard to hypothetical situations yep. yeah okay Great. Sounds good, though. Thank you. And thank you thank for you. your time. It's a pleasure. It's, it's lovely. always a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> it's and, always a pleasure to share time with you. And I know you were a bit nervous you. at the start of this, and I you was. did well with that, so I that's was. very good. I was, I was. I don't know whether I was nervous for me or for my brothers <laughs> and sisters. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, we got through that's it. that's no worries. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for your time. And we'd like to just thank the time of the people yeah. who've been videoing as well. There's, thanks, guys. There's Igor behind that camera, if you guys show each other. There's, <laughs> there's Vlad behind that camera. Smile, Vlad. And, uh, and also, I think, Lena, who's, who's just sitting down down there she she was uh and we had a She's small on. audience listening to the discussion as well so just like to thank you thank guys you for being quiet and, and able to take, cope with the last two hours <laughs> thank thanks. you thanks thanks <laughs> um there was a question that you asked earlier about um the issue of whether there are any aborted children that are earthbound yeah and in terms of connection with their mothers, their own mothers or their own fathers on earth. And, and I answered that I don't know of any aborted children on earth that are, connect, that are still connected to their mothers and fathers on earth and therefore earth bound. However, I must point out that there are a group, a very, very large group of aborted children on earth who are earth bound, who are prevented from entering the spirit world into the spheres, uh, into getting any assistance by groups of spirits who are earthbound as well, who, who grab these children and hold on to them very, very strongly before they actually, actually complete the process of passing. And these spirits hold these children in the earthbound condition because of, because of their own condition. And many of them are um, 
Uh, for example, if I give some example, there is a group of Chinese women spirits who are very, very angry with the government about the, the uh, one-child policy, and every single child that's aborted in China, they try to actually grab hold of and nurse themselves rather than allow them to go to summer land and be looked after by a spirit in a higher condition. And those particular aborted children are earthbound. Are their intentions good intentions? Um, their intention is based on rage. So okay, an intention okay. based on rage can never be good. Their intention is based on rage with the government. Does that make sense? Yeah. Rage, rage with the Chinese government in this case. And so their intention is not a good intention. Um, they don't see it like that, though. They see their rage as a justified rage, yeah. and therefore they're justifying the holding of the children onto the children. And there are many celestial spirits at the moment waiting to take these children and give them a much better environment to grow up in. But unfortunately, these children are, are being held onto by these spirits and, uh, and, and unfortunately not able to be assisted very well. And as a result, they don't grow very well either. So they're very stunted in their growth, and until these celestial spirits can can actually hold on to them and help them, they will remain so. But it's the rage of these women spirits towards the government that keeps these women spirits on earth and, uh, and that's what causes them to grab hold of the children as soon as they pass. So, so there are earthbound aborted children, but they are not connected to their parents. They, it's for a different reason. It's for a different reason. Um, you say that they're stunted in growth. Do they get a to a stage where, um, in age, where they would activate their free will and remove well, themselves from that? Well, because it's very hard for them to grow in this condition, they're, and they don't have much of an intellectual concept of what they're doing. They're only, got, they're only bound by, by the desire of these spirits to be bound to them. Because of that, they can potentially stay in this condition for hundreds of years. Uh, without really knowing that they're mm. in that condition, if that makes sense. Mm. So it's a very sad condition for the aborted child. Uh, but it's also, quite, it's also driven by this rage that these women spirits feel towards the government. So, so if these women spirits could release some of their rage, and some people are trying to help them, yeah. that would also then release these aborted children so that they could go their mm. way and then get looked after afterwards. Yeah. So I just thought I needed to clarify that. Thank you, um, AJ. Just because well, there are no aborted children that are actually that I know of that are actually connected to their yeah. mother and father who aborted them, mm. when the mother and father had no desire had had a desire to abort them. But but there are women, there are children, spirits, aborted children, who are earthbound because of these uh, earthbound spirits catching hold of them and. and and uh, having a very, very strong feeling for them that they need to protect them and look after them, and that binds them together. And so what we're trying to do is assist those groups of spirits so that, so that they no longer do that, and then, then the people who are best able to look after them in the spirit world can look after them. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Igor. Thank you.